Chapter One of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Reading by Andy Minter. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis. Chapter One Our Financial Oligarchy. President Wilson, when Governor, declared in 1911, The great monopoly in this country is the money monopoly. So long as that exists, our old variety and freedom and individual energy of development are out of the question. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men, who, even if their actions be honest and intended for the public interest, are necessarily concentrated upon the great undertakings in which their own money is involved, and who, necessarily, by every reason of their own limitations, chill and check and destroy genuine economic freedom. This is the greatest question of all, and to this statesmen must address themselves with an earnest determination to serve the long future and the true liberties of men. The Pujo Committee, appointed in 1912, found far more dangerous than all that has happened to us in the past in the way of elimination of competition in industry is the control of credit through the domination of these groups over our banks and industries. Whether, under a different currency system, the resources in our banks would be greater or less is comparatively immaterial if they continue to be controlled by a small group. It is impossible that there should be competition with all the facilities for raising money or selling large issues of bonds in the hands of these few bankers and their partners and allies, who together dominate the financial policies of most of the existing systems. The acts of this inner group, as here described, have nevertheless been more destructive of competition than anything accomplished by the trusts, for they strike at the very vitals of potential competition in every industry that is under their protection, a condition which, if permitted to continue, will render impossible all attempts to restore normal competitive conditions in the industrial world. If the arteries of credit, now clogged well nigh to choking by the obstructions created through the control of these groups, are opened, so that they may be permitted freely to play their important part in the financial system, competition in large enterprises will become possible, and business can be conducted on its merits instead of being the subject to the tribute and the good will of this handful of self constituted trustees of the national prosperity. The promise of new freedom was joyously proclaimed in 1913. The facts which the Pujo Investigating Committee and its able counsel, Mr. Samuel Untermeyer, have laid before the country, show clearly the means by which a few men control the business of America. The report proposes measures which promise some relief. Additional remedies will be proposed. Congress will soon be called upon to act. How shall the emancipation be wrought? On what lines shall we proceed? The facts, when fully understood, will teach us. THE DOMINANT ELEMENT The dominant element in our financial oligarchy is the investment banker. Associated trust, trust companies and life insurance companies are his tools. Controlled railroads, public service and industrial corporations are his subjects. Though properly but middlemen, these bankers bestride as masters America's business world so that practically no large enterprise can be undertaken successfully without their participation or approval. These bankers are, of course, able men possessed of large fortunes, but the most potent factor in their control of business is not the possession of extraordinary ability or huge wealth. The key to their power is combination, concentration intensive and comprehensive, advancing on three distinct lines. First, there is the obvious consolidation of banks and trust companies, the less obvious affiliations, through stockholdings, voting trusts, and interlocking directorates, of banking institutions, which are not legally connected, and the joint transactions, gentlemen's agreements, and banking ethics, which eliminate competition among the investment bankers. Second, there is the consolidation of railroads into huge systems, the large combinations of public service corporations, and the formation of industrial trusts, which— 
by making businesses so big that local independent banking concerns cannot alone supply the necessary funds, has created dependence upon the associated New York bankers. But combination, however intensive along these lines only, could not have produced the money trust. Another and more potent factor of combination was added. Third, investment bankers like J.P. Morgan and Company, dealers in bonds, stocks and notes, encroached upon the functions of the three other classes of corporations with which their business brought them into contact. They became the directing power in railroads, public service and industrial companies through which our great business operations are conducted, the makers of bonds and stocks. They became the directing power in the life insurance companies and other corporate reservoirs of the people's savings, the buyers of bonds and stocks. They became the directing power also in banks and trust companies, the depositories of the quick capital of the country, the lifeblood of business, with which they and others carried on their operations. Thus four distinct functions, each essential to business, and each exercised originally by a distinct set of men, became united in the investment banker. It is to this union of business functions that the existence of the money trust is mainly due. Note. Obviously only a few of the investment bankers exercise this great power, but many others perform important functions in the system, as hereinafter described. The development of our financial oligarchy followed, in this respect, lines by which the history of political despotism has familiarized us, usurpation proceeding by gradual encroachment rather than by violent acts, subtle and often long-concealed concentration of distinct functions, which are beneficent when separately administered, and dangerous only when combined in the same persons. It was by processes such as these that Caesar Augustus became master of Rome. The makers of our own constitution had in mind like dangers to our political liberty when they provided so carefully for the separation of governmental powers. The proper sphere of the investment banker. The original function of the investment banker was that of a dealer in bonds, stocks and notes, buying mainly at wholesale from corporations, municipalities, states and governments which need money, and selling to those seeking investments. The banker performs, in this respect, the function of a merchant, and the function is a very useful one. Large business enterprises are conducted generally by corporations. The permanent capital of corporations is represented by bonds and stocks. The bonds and stocks of more important corporations are owned, in large part, by small investors who do not participate in the management of the company. Corporations require the aid of a banker middleman, for they lack generally the reputation and clientele essential to selling their own bonds and stocks direct to the investor. Investors in corporate securities also require the services of a banker middleman. The number of securities upon the market is very large. Only a part of these securities is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, but its listings alone comprise about 1,600 different issues, aggregating about $26.5 billion. And each year new listings are made, averaging about 233 to an amount of $1.5 billion. For a small investor to make an intelligent selection from these many corporate securities, indeed to pass an intelligent judgment upon a single one, is ordinarily impossible. He lacks the ability, the facilities, the training, and the time essential to a proper investigation. Unless his purchase is to be little better than a gamble, he needs the advice of an expert who, combining special knowledge with judgment, has the facilities and incentive to make a thorough investigation. This dependence, both of corporations and of investors, upon the banker has grown in recent years, since women and others who do not participate in the management have become the owners of so large a part of the stocks and bonds of our great corporations. Over half of the stockholders of the American Sugar Refining Company, and nearly half of the stockholders of the Pennsylvania Railroad and of the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad, are women. Goodwill. The possession by a dealer of numerous and valuable regular customers is always an important element in merchandising. But in the business of selling bonds and stocks, it is of exceptional value, for the very reason that the small investor relies so largely upon the banker's judgment. This confidential relation of the banker to customers, and the knowledge of the customer's private affairs acquired incidentally, is often a determining factor in the marketing of securities. 
With the advent of big business, such goodwill possessed by the older banking houses, prominently J.P. Morgan and Company and their Philadelphia house called Drexel and Company, by Lee Higginson and Company and Kidder Peabody and Company of Boston, and by Coon Loeb and Company of New York, became of enhanced importance. The volume of new security issues was greatly increased by huge railroad consolidations, the development of the holding companies, and particularly by the formation of industrial trusts. The rapidly accumulating savings of our people sought investment. The field of operations for the dealer in securities was thus much enlarged. And as the securities were new and untried, the services of the investment banker were in great demand, and his powers and profits increased accordingly. CONTROLLING THE SECURITY MAKERS But this enlargement of their legitimate field of operations did not satisfy investment bankers. They were not content merely to deal in securities. They desired to manufacture them also. They became promoters, or allied themselves with promoters. Thus it was that J. P. Morgan and Company formed the Steel Trust, the Harvester Trust, and the Shipping Trust. And adding the duties of undertaker to those of midwife, the investment bankers became, in times of corporate disaster, members of security holders' protective committees. Then they participated as reorganization managers in the reincarnation of the unsuccessful corporations, and ultimately became directors. It was in this way that the Morgan Associates acquired their hold upon the Southern Railway, the Northern Pacific, the Reading, the Erie, the Père Marquette, the Chicago and Great Western, and the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton. Often they ensured the continuance of such control by the device of the voting trust, but even where no voting trust was created, a secure hold was acquired upon reorganization. It was in this way also that Coon Loeb and Company became potent in the Union Pacific and in the Baltimore and Ohio. But the banker's participation in the management of corporations was not limited to cases of promotion or reorganization. An urgent or extensive need of new money was considered a sufficient reason for the bankers entering a board of directors. Often, without even such excuse, the investment banker has secured a place upon the board of directors through his powerful influence or the control of his customers' proxies. Such seems to have been the fatal entrance of Mr. Morgan into the management of the then prosperous New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad in 1892. When once a banker has entered the board, whatever may have been the occasion, his grip proves tenacious and his influence usually supreme, for he controls the supply of new money. The investment banker is naturally on the lookout for good bargains in bonds and stocks, like other merchants, he wants to buy his merchandise cheap. But when he becomes director of a corporation, he occupies a position which prevents the transaction by which he acquires its corporate securities from being properly called a bargain. Can there be real bargaining where the same man is on both sides of a trade? The investment banker, through his controlling influence on the board of directors, decides that the corporation shall issue and sell the securities, decides the price at which it shall sell them, and decides that it shall sell the securities to himself. The fact that there are other directors besides the banker on board does not in practice prevent this being the result. The banker, who holds the purse strings, becomes usually the dominant spirit. Through voting trusteeships, exclusive financial agencies, membership on executive or finance committees, or by mere directorships, J. P. Morgan and Company, and their associates, held such financial power in at least thirty-two transportation systems, public utility corporations and industrial companies, companies with an aggregate capitalization of $17.273 billion. Mainly for corporations so controlled, J. P. Morgan and Company procured the public marketing in ten years of security issues, aggregating $1.95 billion. This huge sum does not include any issues marketed privately, nor any issues, however marketed, of intrastate corporations. Coon, Loeb and Company, and a few other investment bankers, exercise similar control over many other corporations. Controlling Security Buyers Such control of railroads, public service, and industrial corporations assures to the investment bankers an ample supply of securities at attractive prices, 
and merchandise well bought is half sold, but these bond and stock merchants are not disposed to take even a slight risk as to their ability to market their goods. They saw that if they could control the security buyers, as well as the security makers, investment banking would indeed be a happy hunting ground, and they have made it so. The numerous small investors cannot, in the strict sense, be controlled, but their dependence upon the banker ensures their being duly influenced. A large part, however, of all bonds issued, and of many stocks, are bought by the prominent corporate investors, and most prominent among these are the life insurance companies, the trust companies, and the banks. The purchase of a security by these institutions not only relieves the banker of the merchandise, but recommends it strongly to the small investor, who believes that these institutions are wisely managed. These controlled corporate investors are not only large customers, but may be particularly accommodating ones. Individual investors are moody. They buy only when they want to do so. They are sometimes inconveniently reluctant. Corporate investors, if controlled, may be made to buy when the bankers need a market. It was natural that the investment bankers proceeded to get control of the great life insurance companies, as well as of the trust companies and the banks. The field thus occupied is uncommonly rich. The life insurance companies are our leading institutions for savings. Their huge surplus and reserves, augmented daily, are always clamouring for investment. No panic or money shortage stops the inflow of new money from the perennial stream of premiums on existing policies and interest on existing investments. The three great companies, the New York Life, the Mutual of New York, and the Equitable, would have over 55 million of new money to invest annually, even if they did not issue a single new policy. In 1904, just before the Armstrong investigation, these three companies had together one billion two hundred and forty seven million three hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred and thirty eight dollars and eighteen cents of assets. They had issued in that year one thousand and twenty five million six hundred and seventy one thousand one hundred and twenty six dollars of new policies. The New York legislature placed in 1906 certain restrictions upon their growth, so that their new business since has averaged $547,384,212, or only 53% of what it was in 1904. But the aggregate assets of these companies increased in the last eight years to $1,817,052,000, at the time of the Armstrong investigation, the average age of these three companies was 56 years. The growth of assets in the last eight years was about half as large as the total growth in the preceding 56 years. These three companies must invest annually about $70 million of new money, and besides, many old investments expire or are changed, and the proceeds must be reinvested. A large part of all life insurance surplus and reserves are invested in bonds. The aggregate bond investments of these three companies on January the 1st, 1913, was $1,019,153,268.93. It was natural that the investment bankers should seek to control these never-failing reservoirs of capital. George W. Perkins was vice-president of the New York Life, the largest of the companies. While remaining such, he was made a partner in J.P. Morgan & Company, and in the four years preceding the Armstrong investigation, his firm sold the New York Life $38,804,918.51 in securities. The New York Life is a mutual company, supposed to be controlled by its policyholders, but as the Pujo Committee finds, the so-called control of life insurance companies by policyholders through mutualization is a farce, and its only result is to keep in office a self-constituted, self-perpetuating management. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a stock company, and is controlled by a hundred thousand dollars worth of stock. The dividend on this stock is limited by law to seven per cent, but in 1910, Mr. Morgan paid about $3 million for $51,000 worth par value of this stock, or $5,882.35 a share. 
the dividend return on the stock investment is less than one-eighth of one per cent, but the assets controlled amount to now over five hundred million dollars, and certain of these assets had an especial value for investment bankers, namely the large holdings of stock in banks and trust companies. The Armstrong investigation disclosed the extent of financial powers exerted through the insurance company holdings of bank and trust company stock. The committee recommended legislation compelling the insurance companies to dispose of the stock within five years. A law to that effect was enacted, but the time was later extended. The companies then disposed of a part of their bank and trust company stocks, but as the insurance companies were controlled by the investment bankers, these gentlemen sold the bank and trust company stocks to themselves. Referring to such purchases from the mutual life, as well as from the equitable, the Pugio Committee found, Here, then, were stocks of five important trust companies and one of our largest national banks in New York City that had been held by these two life insurance companies. Within five years, all of these stocks, so far as distributed by the insurance companies, have found their way into the hands of the men who virtually controlled, or were identified with the management of the insurance companies, or of their close allies and associates, to that extent thus further enriching them. The banks and trust companies are depositories, in the main, not of the people's savings, but of the businessman's quick capital. Yet, since the investment banker acquired control of banks and trust companies, these institutions also have become, like the life companies, large purchasers of bonds and stocks. Many of our national banks have invested in this manner a large part of all their resources, including capital, surplus, and deposits. The bank investments of some banks exceed by far the aggregate of their capital and surplus, and nearly equal their loanable deposits. CONTROLLING OTHER PEOPLE'S QUICK CAPITAL The goose that lays golden eggs has been considered a most valuable possession, but even more profitable is the privilege of taking the golden eggs laid by somebody else's goose. The investment bankers and their associates now enjoy that privilege. They control the people through the people's own money. If the banker's power were commensurate only with their wealth, they would have relatively little influence on American business. Vast fortunes like those of the Astors are no doubt regrettable. They are inconsistent with democracy. They are unsocial, and they seem particularly unjust when they represent largely unearned increment. But the wealth of the Astors does not endanger political or industrial liberty. It is insignificant in amount, as compared with the aggregate wealth of America, or even of New York City. It lacks significance, largely because its owners have only the income from their own wealth, the Astor wealth is static. The wealth of the Morgan Associates is dynamic. The power and the growth of power in our financial oligarchs comes from wielding the savings and quick capital of others. In two or three great life insurance companies, the influence of J.P. Morgan and Company and their associates is exerted without any individual investment by them whatsoever. Even in the equitable, where Mr. Morgan bought an actual majority of all the outstanding stock, his investment amounts to little more than one-half of one per cent of the assets of the company. The fetters which bind the people are forged from the people's own gold. But the reservoir of other people's money, from which the investment bankers now draw their greatest power, is not the life insurance companies, but the banks and trust companies. Bank deposits represent the really quick capital of the nation. They are the lifeblood of businesses. Their effective force is much greater than that of an equal amount of wealth permanently invested. The thirty-four banks and trust companies, which the Pujo Committee declared to be directly controlled by the Morgan Associates, held $1,983,000,000 in deposits. Control of these institutions means the ability to lend a large part of these funds directly and indirectly to themselves, and what is often even more important, the power to prevent the funds being lent to any rival interests. These huge deposits can, in the discretion of those in control, be used to meet the temporary needs of their subject corporations. When bonds and stocks are issued to finance permanently these corporations, the bank deposits can, in large part, be loaned by the investment bankers in control to themselves and their associates, so that securities bought may be carried by them until sold to investors. 
or these bank deposits may be loaned to allied bankers, or jobbers in securities, or to speculators, to enable them to carry the bonds or stocks. Easy money tends to make securities rise in the market. Tight money nearly always makes them fall. The control by the leading investment bankers over the banks and trust companies is so great that they can often determine, for a time, the market for money by lending or refusing to lend on the stock exchange. In this way, among others, they have the power to affect the general trend of prices in bonds and stocks. Their power over a particular security is even greater. Its sale on the market may depend on whether the security is favoured or discriminated against when offered to the banks and trust companies as collateral for loans. Furthermore, it is the investment banker's access to other people's money in controlled banks and trust companies which alone enables any individual banking concern to take so large a part of the annual output of bonds and stocks. The banker's own capital, however large, would soon be exhausted, and even the loanable funds of the banks would often be exhausted, but for the large deposits made in those banks by the life insurance railroad public service and industrial corporations, which the bankers also control. On December the 31st, 1912, the three leading life insurance companies had deposits in banks and trust companies aggregating $13,839,189.08. As the Pujo Committee finds, the men who through their control over the funds of our railroads and industrial companies are able to direct where such funds shall be kept, and thus to create those great reservoirs of the people's money, are the ones who are in position to tap those reservoirs for the ventures in which they are interested, and to prevent their being tapped for purposes of which they do not approve. The latter is quite as important a factor as the former. It is the controlling consideration in its effect on competition in the railroad and industrial world. HAVING YOUR CAKE AND EATING IT TOO but the power of the investment banker over other people's money is often more direct and effective than that exerted through controlled banks and just companies. J.P. Morgan and Company achieve the supposedly impossible feat of having their cake and eating it too. They buy the bonds and stocks of controlled railroads and industrial concerns and pay the purchase price, and still do not part with their money. This is accomplished by the simple device of becoming the bank of deposit of the controlled corporations, instead of having the company deposit in some merely controlled bank, in whose operation others have at least some share. When J.P. Morgan and Company buy an issue of securities, the purchase money, instead of being paid over to the corporation, is retained by the banker for the corporation, to be drawn upon only as the funds are needed by the corporation. And as the securities are issued in large blocks, and the money raised is often not all spent until long thereafter, the aggregate of the balances remaining in the banker's hands are huge. Thus, J.P. Morgan and Company, including their Philadelphia house called Drexel and Company, held on November the 1st, 1912, deposits aggregating $162,491,819.65. Power and Pelf the operations of so comprehensive a system of concentration are necessarily developed in the banker's overweening power. And the banker's power grows by what it feeds on. Power begets wealth, and added wealth opens ever new opportunities for the acquisition of wealth and power. The operations of these bankers are so vast and numerous that even a very reasonable compensation for the service performed by the bankers would, in the aggregate, produce for them incomes so large as to result in huge accumulations of capital. But the compensation taken by the bankers as commissions or profits is often far from reasonable. Occupying, as they so frequently do, the inconsistent position of being at the same time seller and buyer, the standard for so-called compensation actually applied is not the rule of reason, but all the traffic will bear. And this is true even when there is no sinister motive— the weakness of human nature prevents men from being good judges of their own deservings. The syndicate formed by J.P. Morgan and Company to underwrite the United States Steel Corporation took for its services securities which netted $62,500,000 in cash. Of this huge sum, J.P. Morgan and Company received, as syndicate managers, $12,500,000 in addition to the share which they were entitled to receive as syndicate members. 
This sum of $62,500,000 was only part of the fees paid for the service of monopolising the steel industry. In addition to the commissions taken specifically for organising the United States Steel Corporation, large sums were paid for organising the several companies of which it is composed. For instance, the National Tube Company was capitalised at $80 million of stock, $40 million of which was common stock. Half of this $44 million was taken by J.P. Morgan & Company and their associates for promotion services, and the $20 million stock so taken became later exchangeable for $25 million of steel common. Commissioner of Corporations Herbert Knox Smith found that more than $150 million of the stock of steel corporation was issued directly or indirectly through exchange for mere promotion or underwriting services, in other words, nearly one-seventh of the total capital stock of the Steel Corporation appears to have been issued directly or indirectly to promoters' services. The so-called fees and commissions taken by the bankers and associates upon the organisation of the trusts have been exceptionally large. But even after the trusts are successfully launched, the exaction of the bankers are often extortionate. The syndicate which underwrote, in 1901, the Steel Corporation's preferred stock conversion plan advanced only $20 million in cash and received an underwriting commission of $6,800,000. The exaction of huge commissions is not confined to trust and other industrial concerns. The Interborough Railway is a most prosperous corporation. It earned last year nearly 21% on its capital stock, and secured from New York City, in connection with the subway extension, a very favourable contract. But when it financed its $170 million bond issue, it was agreed that J.P. Morgan & Company should receive 3%, that is, $5,100,000, for merely forming this syndicate. More recently, the New York, New Haven & Hartford Railroad agreed to pay J.P. Morgan & Company a commission of $1,680,000, that is, 2.5%, to form a syndicate to underwrite an issue at par of $67 million, 20 years 6% convertible debentures. That means the bankers bound themselves to take, at 97.5, any of these 6% convertible bonds which stockholders might be unwilling to buy at 100. When the contract was made, the New Haven's then outstanding 6% convertible bonds were selling at 114, and the new issue, as soon as announced, was in such demand that the public offered, and was for months willing to buy at 106, bonds which the company were to pay J.P. Morgan & Company $1,680,000 to be willing to take at par. Why the Banks Became Investment Bankers these large profits from promotions, underwritings, and security purchases led to a revolutionary change in the conduct of our leading banking institutions. It was obvious that control by the investment bankers of the deposits in banks and trust companies was an essential element in their securing these huge profits, and the bank officers naturally asked, why then should not the banks and trust companies share in so profitable a field? Why should not they themselves become investment bankers too, with all the new functions incident to big business? To do so would involve a departure from the legitimate sphere of the banking business, which is the making of temporary loans to business concerns. But the temptation was irresistible. The invasion of the investment banker into the bank's field of operation was followed by a counter-invasion by the banks into the realm of the investment banker. Most prominent among the banks were the National City and the First National of New York. But theirs was not a hostile invasion. The contending forces met as allies, joined forces to control the business of the country, and to divide the spoils. The alliance was cemented by voting trusts, by interlocking directorates, and by joint ownerships. There resulted the fullest cooperation, and ever more railroads, public service corporations, and industrial concerns were brought into complete subjection. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Other People's Money」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer Other People's Money 
by Louis D. Brandeis. Chapter 2. How the Combiners Combine. Among the Allies, two New York banks, the National City and the First National, stand preeminent. They constitute, with the Morgan firm, the inner group of the Money Trust. Each of the two banks, like J.P. Morgan and Company, has huge resources. Each of the two banks, like the firm of J.P. Morgan and Company, has been dominated by a genius in combination. In the National City, it is James Stillman, and in the First National, George F. Baker. Each of these gentlemen was formerly president and is now chairman of the board of directors. The resources of the National City Bank, including its Siamese twin security company, are about $300 million. Those of the First National Bank, including its Siamese twin security company, are about $200 million. The resources of the Morgan firm have not been disclosed, but it appears that they have available for their operations also huge deposits from their subjects, deposits reported as $162,500,000. The private fortunes of the chief actors in the combination have not been ascertained, but sporadic evidence indicates how great are the possibilities of accumulation when one has the use of other people's money. Mr. Morgan's wealth became proverbial. Of Mr. Stillman's many investments, only one was specifically referred to as he was in Europe during the investigation and did not testify, but that one is significant. His 47,498 shares in the National City Bank are worth about $18 million. Mr. Jacob H. Schliff aptly describes this as a very nice investment. Of Mr. Baker's investments, we know more, as he testified on many subjects. His 20,000 shares in the First National Bank are worth at least $20 million. His stock in six other New York banks and trust companies are together worth about $3 million. The scale of his investment in railroads may be inferred from his former holdings in the Central Railroad of New Jersey. He was its largest stockholder, so large that with a few friends he held a majority of the $27,436,800 par value of outstanding stock, which the Reading bought at $160 a share. He is a director in 28 other railroad companies, and presumably a stockholder in at least as many. The full extent of his fortune was not inquired into, for that was not an issue in the investigation. But it is not surprising that Mr. Baker saw little need of new laws. When asked, you think everything is all right as it is in the world, do you not? He answered, pretty nearly. Ramifications of Power But wealth expressed in figures gives a wholly inadequate picture of the Allies' power. Their wealth is dynamic. It is wielded by geniuses in combination. It finds its proper expression in means of control. To comprehend the power of the Allies, we must try to visualize the ramifications through which the forces operate. Mr. Baker is a director in 22 corporations, having, with their many subsidiaries, an aggregate resource or capitalization of $7,272,000,000. But the direct and visible power of the First National Bank which Mr. Baker dominates, extends further. The Peugeot report shows that its directors, including Mr. Baker's son, are directors in at least 27 other corporations with resources of $4,270,000,000. That is, the First National is represented in 49 corporations with aggregate resources or capitalization of $11,542,000,000. It may help to an appreciation of the Allies' power to name a few of the more prominent corporations in which, for instance, Mr. Baker's influence is exerted, visibly and directly, as voting trustee, executive committeeman, or simple director. 1. Banks, Trusts, and Life Insurance Companies First National Bank of New York National Bank of Commerce Farmers Loan and Trust Company 
Mutual Life Insurance Company. Two, railroad companies. New York Central Lines, New Haven, Reading, Erie, Lackawanna, Lehigh Valley, Southern, Northern Pacific, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. Three, public service corporations. American Telegraph and Telephone Company. Adams Express Company. Four, industrial corporations. United States Steel Corporation. Pullman Company. Mr. Stillman is a director in only seven corporations, with aggregate assets of $2,476,000,000. But the directors in the National City Bank, which he dominates, are directors in at least 41 other corporations, which, with their subsidiaries, have an aggregate capitalization or resource of $10,564,000,000. The members of the firm of J.P. Morgan & Company, the acknowledged leader of the Allied Forces, hold 72 directorships in 47 of the largest corporations of the country. The Peugeot Committee finds that members of J.P. Morgan & Company and the directors of their controlled trust companies and of the First National and the National City Bank together hold 118 directorships in 34 banks and trust companies, having total resources of $2,679,000,000 and total deposits of $1,983,000,000. 30 directorships in 10 insurance companies, having total assets of $2,293,000,000. 105 directorships in 32 transportation systems, having a total capitalization of $11,784,000,000 and a total mileage, excluding express companies and steamship lines, of 150200 63 directorships in 24 producing and trading corporations, having a total capitalization of $3,339,000,000. 25 directorships in 12 public utility corporations, having a total capitalization of $2,150,000,000. In all, 341 directorships in 112 corporations, having aggregate resources or capitalization of $22,245,000,000. 22 billion dollars. $22 billion is a large sum, so large that we have difficulty in grasping its significance. The mind realizes size only through comparisons. With what can we compare twenty-two billions of dollars? Twenty-two billions of dollars is more than three times the assessed value of all the property, real and personal, in all New England. It is nearly three times the assessed value of all the real estate in the city of New York. It is more than twice the assessed value of all the property in the thirteen southern states. It is more than the assessed value of all the property in the twenty-two states, north and south, lying west of the Mississippi River. But the huge sum of twenty-two billion dollars is not large enough to include all the corporations to which the influence of the three allies, directly and visibly, extends. For, first, there are fifty-six other corporations, not included in the Peugeot schedule, each with capital or resources of over five million dollars, and aggregating nearly one billion three hundred and fifty million dollars, in which the Morgan allies are represented, according to the directories of directors. Second, the Peugeot schedule does not include any corporation with resources of less than five million dollars. But these financial giants have shown their humility by becoming directors in many such. For instance, members of J.P. Morgan & Company and directors in the National City Bank and the First National Bank are also directors in 158 such corporations. Available publications disclose the capitalization of only 38 of these. But those 38 aggregate $78,669,375. Third, the Peugeot schedule includes only the corporations in which the Morgan Associates actually appear by name as directors. 
it does not include those in which they are represented by dummies or otherwise. For instance, the Morgan influence certainly extends to the Kansas City Terminal Railway Company, for which they have marketed since 1910, in connection with others, four issues aggregating $41,761,000. But no member of J.P. Morgan & Company, of the National City Bank, or of the First National Bank, appears on the Kansas City Terminal Directorate. Fourth, the Peugeot schedule does not include all the subsidiaries of the corporation scheduled. For instance, the capitalization of the New Haven system is given as $385 million. That sum represents the bond and stock capital of the New Haven Railroad. But the New Haven system comprises many controlled corporations whose capitalization is only to a slight extent included directly or indirectly in the New Haven Railroad balance sheet. The New Haven, like most large corporations, is a holding company also. And a holding company may control subsidiaries while owning but a small part of the latter's outstanding securities. Only the small part so held will be represented in the holding company's balance sheet. Thus, while the New Haven Railroad's capitalization is only $385 million, and that sum only appears in the Peugeot schedule, the capitalization of the New Haven system, as shown by a chart submitted to the committee, is over twice as great, namely $849 million. It is clear, therefore, that the $22 billion referred to by the Peugeot Committee, understates the extent of the concentration affected by the inner group of the Money Trust. Cementing the Triple Alliance Care was taken by these builders of imperial power that their structure should be enduring. It has been buttressed on every side by joint ownerships and mutual stockholdings, as well as by close personal relationships. For directorships are ephemeral, and may end with a new election. Mr. Morgan and his partners acquired one-sixth of the stock of the First National Bank and made a $6 million investment in the stock of the National City Bank. Then J.P. Morgan and Company, the National City, and the First National, or their dominant officers, Mr. Stillman and Mr. Baker, acquired together by stock purchases and voting trusts control of the National Bank of Commerce with its $190 million of resources, of the Chase National, with $125 million, of the Guarantee Trust Company, with $232 million, of the Bankers Trust Company, with $205 million, and of a number of smaller but important financial institutions. They became joint voting trustees in great railroad systems, and finally, as if the Allies were united into a single concern, loyal and efficient service in the banks, like that rendered by Mr. Davidson and Mr. Lamont in the First National, was rewarded by promotion to membership in the firm of J.P. Morgan and Company. The Provincial Allies Thus equipped and bound together, J.P. Morgan and Company, the National City, and the First National easily dominated America's financial center, New York. For certain other important bankers, to be hereafter mentioned, were held in restraint by gentlemen's agreements. The three allies dominated Philadelphia, too, for the firm of Drexel & Company is J.P. Morgan & Company, under another name. But there are two other important money centers in America, Boston and Chicago. In Boston, there are two large international banking houses, Lee Higginson & Company and Kidder Peabody & Company both long established and rich, and each possessing an extensive, wealthy clientele of eager investors in bonds and stocks. Since 1907, each of these firms has purchased or underwritten, principally in conjunction with other bankers, about 100 different security issues of the greater interstate corporations, the issues of each banker amounting, in the aggregate, to over $1 billion concentration of banking capital has proceeded even further in Boston than in New York. By successive consolidations, the number of national banks has been reduced from 58 in 1898 
to 19 in 1913. There are in Boston now also 23 trust companies. The National Schwamont Bank, the First National Bank of Boston, and the Old Colony Trust Company, which these two Boston banking houses and their associates control, alone have aggregate resources of $288,386,294, constituting about one-half of the banking resources of the city. These great banking institutions, which are themselves the result of many consolidations, and the 21 other banks and trust companies, in which their directors are also directors, hold together 90% of the total banking resources of Boston. And linked to them by interlocking directorates are nine other banks and trust companies whose aggregate resources are about 2.5% of Boston's total. Thus, of 42 banking institutions, 33 with aggregate resources of $560,516,239, holding about 92.5% of the aggregate banking resources of Boston, are interlocked. But even the remaining nine banks and trust companies, which together hold but 7.5% of Boston's banking resources, are not all independent of one another. Three are linked together, so that there appear to be only six banks in all Boston that are free from interlocking directorate relations. They together represent but 5% of Boston's banking resources. And it may well be doubted whether all of even those six are entirely free from affiliations with the other groups. Boston's banking concentration is not limited to the legal confines of the city. Around Boston proper are over 30 suburbs, with which it forms what is popularly known as Greater Boston. These suburban municipalities, and also other important cities like Worcester and Springfield, are in many respects within Boston's sphere of influence. Boston's inner banking group has interlocked not only 33 of the 42 banks of Boston proper, as above shown, but it has linked with them, by interlocking directorships, at least 42 other banks and trust companies in 35 other municipalities. Once Lee Higginson and Company and Kidder Peabody and Company were active competitors. They are so still in some small or purely local matters, but both are devoted cooperators with the Morgan Associates in larger and interstate transactions, and the alliance with these great Boston banking houses has been cemented by mutual stock holdings and co-directorships. Financial concentration seems to have found its highest expression in Boston. Somewhat similar relations exist between the Triple Alliance and Chicago's great financial institutions. Its First National Bank, the Illinois Trust and Savings Bank, and the Continental and Commercial National Bank, which together control resources of $561 million dollars and similar relations would doubtlessly be found to exist with leading bankers of the other important financial centers of America, as to which the Peugeot Committee was prevented by lack of time from making investigation. The Auxiliaries Such are the primary, such the secondary powers, which compromise the money trust. But these are supplemented by forces of magnitude, radiating from these principal groups says the Peugeot Committee, and closely affiliated with them are smaller but important banking houses such as Kissel, Kinnicott and Company, White Weld and Company, and Harvey Fisk and Sons, who receive large and lucrative patronage from the dominating groups, and are used by the latter as jobbers or distributors of securities, the issuing of which they control, but for which reasons of their own they prefer not to have issued or distributed under their own names. Lee, Higginson and Company, besides being partners with the inner group, are also frequently utilized in this service because of their facilities as distributors of securities. For instance, J.P. Morgan and Company, as fiscal agents of the New Haven Railroad, had the right to market its securities and that of its subsidiaries. Among the numerous New Haven subsidiaries is the New York, Westchester, and Boston, 
the road which cost one million five hundred thousand dollars a mile to build and which earned a deficit last year of nearly one million five hundred thousand dollars besides failing to earn any return upon the new haven's own stock and bond investment of eight million two hundred forty one thousand nine hundred and fifty one dollars when the new haven concluded to market seventeen million two hundred thousand dollars of these bonds j p morgan and company for reasons of their own preferred not to have these bonds issued or distributed under their own name the morgan firm took the bonds at ninety two and a half net and the bonds were marketed by kissel kinnicott and company and others at ninety six and a quarter the satellites the alliance is still further supplemented, as the Peugeot Committee shows. Beyond these inner groups and subgroups are banks and bankers throughout the country who cooperate with them in underwriting or guaranteeing the sales of securities offered to the public, and who also act as distributors of such securities. It was impossible to learn the identity of these corporations, owing to the unwillingness of the members of the inner group to disclose the names of their underwriters but sufficient appears to justify the statement that there are at least hundreds of them, and that they extend into many of the cities throughout this and foreign countries. The patronage thus proceeding from the inner group and its subgroups is of great value to these banks and bankers, who are thus tied by self-interest to the great issuing houses, and may be regarded as part of this vast financial organization." Such patronage yields no inconsiderable part of the income of these banks and bankers, and without much risk on the account of the facilities of the principal groups for placing issues of securities through their domination of great banks and trust companies, and their other domestic affiliations and their foreign connections. The underwriting commissions on issues made by this inner group are usually easily earned, but do not ordinarily involve the underwriters in the purchase of the underwritten securities. Their interest in the transaction is generally adjusted, unless they choose to purchase part of the securities, by the payment to them of a commission. There are, however, occasions on which this is not the case. The underwriters are then required to take the securities, Bankers and brokers are so anxious to be permitted to participate in these transactions under the lead of the inner group that, as a rule, they join when invited to do so, regardless of their approval of the particular business, least by refusing they should thereafter cease to be invited. In other words, an invitation from these royal bankers is interpreted as a command. As a result, these great bankers frequently get huge commissions without themselves distributing any of the bonds, or even having taken any actual risk. In the case of the New York subway financing, $170 million of bonds by Messrs. Morgan and Company and their associates, Mr. Davison, as the Peugeot Committee reports, estimated that there were from 100 to 125 such underwriters who were apparently glad to agree that Messrs. Morgan and Company the First National Bank, and the National City Bank, should receive 3%, equal to $5,100,000, for forming this syndicate, thus relieving themselves from all liability, whilst the underwriters assumed the risk of what bonds would realize, and of being required to take their share of the unsold portion. The Protection of Pseudo-Ethics the organization of the money trust is intensive, the combination comprehensive, but one other element was recognized as necessary to render it stable and to make its dynamic force irresistible. Despotism, be it financial or political, is vulnerable unless it is believed to rest upon a moral sanction. The longing for freedom is ineradicable. It will express itself in protest against servitude and inaction unless the striving for freedom be made to seem immoral. Long ago monarchs invented, as a preservative of absolutism, the fiction of the divine right of kings. Bankers, imitating royalty, invented recently the precious rule of so-called ethics, by which it is declared unprofessional to come to the financial relief of any corporation 
which is already the prey of another reputable banker. The possibility of competition between these banking houses in the purchase of securities, says the Peugeot Commission, is further removed by the understanding between them and others that one will not seek, by offering better terms, to take away from another a customer which it has theretofore served, and by corollary of this, namely, that where given bankers, having once satisfactorily united in bringing out an issue of a corporation, they shall also join in bringing out any subsequent issue of the same corporations. This is described as a principle of banking ethics. The ethical basis of the rule must be that the interests of the combined bankers are superior to the interests of the rest of the community. Their attitude reminds one of the sphere of influence with ample hinterlands which rapacious nations are adjusting differences. Important banking concerns, too ambitious to be willing to take a subordinate position in the alliance, and too powerful to be suppressed, are accorded a financial sphere of influence upon the understanding that the rule of banking ethics will be faithfully observed. Most prominent among such lesser potentates are Kuhn, Loeb, and Company, of New York, an international banking house of great wealth, with large clientele and connections. They are accorded an important sphere of influence in American railroading, including, among other systems, the Baltimore and Ohio, the Union Pacific, and the Southern Pacific. They and the Morgan Group have, with few exceptions, preempted the banking business of the important railroads of the country. But even Kuhn, Loeb, and Company are not wholly independent. The Peugeot Committee reports that they are qualified allies of the inner group, and through their close relations with the National City Bank and the National Bank of Commerce and other financial institutions, have many interests in common with the Morgan Associates, conducting large joint account operations with them. The evils resultant. First, these banker barons levy, through their excessive exactions, a heavy toll upon the whole community, upon owners of money for leave to invest it, upon railroads, public service, and industrial companies for leave to use this money of other people, and, through these corporations, upon consumers. The charge of capital, says the Peugeot Committee, which of course enters universally into the price of commodities and of service, is thus in effect, determined by agreement among those supplying it, and not under the check of competition. If there be any virtue in the principle of competition, certainly any plan or arrangement which prevents its operation in the performance of so fundamental a commercial function as the supplying of capital is peculiarly injurious. Second, more serious, however, is the effect of the money trust in directly suppressing competition. That suppression enables the monopolists to exhort excessive profits but monopoly increases the burden of the consumer even more in other ways. Monopoly arrests development, and through arresting development, prevents the lessening of the cost of production and of distribution, which would otherwise take place. Can full competition exist among the anthrite coal railroads when the Morgan Associates are potent in all of them? And with like conditions prevailing, what competition is to be expected between the Northern Pacific and the Great Northern, the Southern, the Louisville and Nashville, and the Atlantic Coastline, or between the Westinghouse Manufacturing Company and the General Electric Company. As the Peugeot Committee finds, such affiliations tend as a cover and conduit for secret arrangements and understandings in restriction of competition through the agency of the banking house thus situated and under existing conditions of combination, relief through other banking houses is precluded. It can hardly be expected that the banks, trust companies, and other institutions that are thus seeking participation from this inner group would be likely to engage in business of a character that would be displeasing to the latter or would interfere with their plans or prestige. And so the protection that can be afforded by the members of the inner group constitutes the safest refuge of our great industrial combinations against future competition. The powerful grip of these gentlemen is upon the throttle that controls the wheels of credit, and upon their signal those wheels will turn or stop. 
Third, but far more serious even than the suppression of competition, is the suppression of industrial liberty, indeed of manhood itself, which this overweening financial power entails. The intimidation which it affects extends far beyond the banks, trust companies, and other institutions seeking participation from this inner group in their lucrative underwritings, and far beyond those interested in the great corporations directly dependent upon the inner group. Its blighting and benumbing effect extends as well to the small and seemingly independent businessman, to the vast army of professional men and others directly dependent upon big business, and to many another, for, one, nearly every enterprising businessman needs bank credit. The granting of credit involves the exercise of judgment of the bank officials, and however honestly the bank officials may wish to exercise their discretion, experience shows that their judgment is warped by the existence of the all-pervading power of the money trust. He who openly opposes the great interests will often be found to lack that quality of safe and saneness, which is the basis of financial credit. 2. Nearly every enterprising businessman and a large part of our professional men have something to sell to, or must buy something from, the great corporations to which the control or influence of the money lords extends directly, or from or to affiliated interests. Sometimes it is merchandise, sometimes it is service, Sometimes they have nothing, either to buy or to sell, but desire political or social advancement. Sometimes they want merely peace. Experience shows that it is not healthy to buck against a locomotive. And business is business. Here and there you will find a hero, red-blooded and courageous, loving manhood more than wealth, place or security, who dared to fight for independence and won. Here and there you may find the martyr, who resisted in silence and suffered with resignation. But America, which seeks the greatest good of the greatest number, cannot be content with conditions that fit only the hero, the martyr, or the slave. End of chapter 2 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 3 of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis. Chapter 3 Interlocking Directorates. The practice of interlocking directorates is the root of many evils, it offends laws human and divine. Applied to rival corporations, it tends to the suppression of competition and to violation of the Sherman Law. Applied to corporations, which deal with each other, it tends to disloyalty and to violation of the fundamental law that no man can serve two masters. In either event, it tends to inefficiency, for it removes incentive and destroys soundness of judgment. It is undemocratic, for it rejects the platform, a fair field and no favors substituting the pull of privilege for the push of manhood. It is the most potent instrument of the money trust. Break the control so exercised by the investment bankers over railroads, public service and industrial corporations, over banks, life insurance and trust companies, and a long step will have been taken toward attainment of the new freedom. The term interlocking directorates is here used in a broad sense as including all intertwined conflicting interests whatever the form, and by whatever device effected. The objection extends alike to contracts of a corporation, whether with one of its directors individually, or with a firm of which he is a member, or with another corporation in which he is interested as an officer or director or stockholder. The objection extends likewise to men holding the inconsistent position of director in two potentially competing corporations even if those corporations do not actually deal with each other. The Endless Chain A simple example will illustrate the vicious circle of control, the endless chain, through which our financial oligarchy now operates. 
j p morgan or a partner a director of the new york new haven and hartford railroad causes that company to sell to j p morgan and company an issue of bonds j p morgan and company borrow the money with which to pay for the bonds from the guarantee trust company of which mr morgan or a partner is a director j p morgan and company sell the bonds to the penn mutual life insurance company of which mr morgan or a partner is a director the new haven spends the proceeds of the bonds in purchasing steel rails from the united states steel corporation of which mr morgan or a partner is a director the united states steel corporation spends the proceeds of the rails in purchasing electrical supplies from the general electric company of which mr morgan or a partner is a director the general electric sells supplies to the western union telegraph company a subsidiary of the american telephone and telegraph company and in both mr morgan or a partner is a director the telegraph company has an exclusive wire contract with the reading of which mr morgan or a partner is a director the reading buys its passenger cars from the pullman company of which mr morgan or a partner is a director the pullman company buys for local use locomotives from the baldwin locomotive company of which mr morgan or a partner is a director the reading the general electric the steel corporation and the new haven like the pullman buy locomotives from the baldwin company the steel corporation the telephone company the new haven the reading the pullman and the baldwin companies like western union buy electrical supplies from the general electric the baldwin the pullman the reading the telephone the telegraph and the general electric companies like the new haven buy steel products from the steel corporation each and every one of the companies last named markets its securities through j p morgan and company each deposits its funds with j p morgan and company and with these funds of each the firm enters upon further operations the specific illustration is in part suppositious but it represents truthfully the operation of interlocking directorates only it must be multiplied many times and with many permutations to represent fully the extent to which the interests of a few men are intertwined instead of taking the new haven as the railroad starting point in our example the new york central the santa fe the southern the lehigh valley the chicago and great western the erie or the pear marquette might have been selected instead of the guarantee trust company as the banking reservoir any one of a dozen other important banks or trust companies instead of the penn mutual as purchaser of the bonds other insurance companies instead of the general electric its qualified competitor the westinghouse electric and manufacturing company the chain is indeed endless for each controlled corporation is entwined with many others as the nexus of big business the steel corporation stands of course preeminent the Stanley Commission showed that the few men who control the Steel Corporation, itself an owner of important railroads, are directors also in 29 other railroad systems with 126,000 miles of line, more than half the railroad mileage of the United States, and in important steamship companies. Through all these alliances and the huge traffic it controls, the Steel Corporation's influence pervades railroad and steamship companies not as carriers only but as the largest customers for steel and its influence with users of steel extends much further these same few men are also directors in twelve steel using street railway systems including some of the largest in the world they are directors in forty machinery and similar steel using manufacturing companies in many gas oil and water companies extensive users of iron products and in the great wire using telephone and telegraph companies the aggregate assets of these different corporations through which these few men exert their influence over the business of the united states exceeds sixteen billion dollars obviously interlocking directorates and all that term implies must be effectually prohibited before the freedom of american business can be regained the prohibition will not be an innovation it will merely give full legal sanction to the fundamental law of morals and of human nature that no man can serve two masters 
the surprising fact is that a principle of equity so firmly rooted should have been departed from it all in dealing with corporations for no rule of law has in other connections been more rigorously applied than that which prohibits a trustee from occupying inconsistent positions from dealing with himself or from using his fiduciary position for personal profit and a director of a corporation is as obviously a trustee as persons holding similar positions in an unincorporated association or in a private trust estate who are called specifically by that name the courts have recognized this fully thus the court of appeals of new york declared in an important case while not technically trustees for the title of the corporate property was in the corporation itself they were charged with the duties and subject to the liabilities of trustees clothed with the power of controlling the property and managing the affairs of the corporation without let or hindrance as to third persons they were its agents but as to the corporation itself equity holds them liable as trustees while courts of law generally treat the directors as agents courts of equity treat them as trustees and hold them to a strict account for any breach of the trust relation for all practical purposes they are trustees when called upon in equity to account for their official conduct nullifying the law but this wholesome rule of business so clearly laid down was practically nullified by courts in creating two unfortunate limitations as concessions doubtless to the supposed needs of commerce first courts held valid contracts between a corporation and a director or between two corporations with a common director where it was shown that in making the contract the corporation was represented by independent directors and that the vote of the interested director was unnecessary to carry the motion and his presence was not needed to constitute a quorum second the courts held that even where a common director participated actively in the making of a contract between two corporations the contract was not absolutely void but voidable only at the election of the corporation the first limitation ignored the rule of law that a beneficiary is entitled to disinterested advice from all his trustees and not merely from some and that a trustee may violate his trust by inaction as well as by action it ignored also the laws of human nature in assuming that the influence of a director is confined to the act of voting everyone knows that the most effective work is done before any vote is taken subtly and without provable participation everyone should know that the denial of minority representation on boards of directors has resulted in the domination of most corporations by one or two men and in practically banishing all criticism of the dominant power and even where the board is not so dominated there is too often that harmonious cooperation among directors which secures for each in his own line a due share of the corporation's favors the second limitation by which contracts in the making of which the interested director participates actively are held merely voidable instead of absolutely void ignores the teachings of experience to hold such contracts merely voidable has resulted practically in declaring them valid it is the directors who control corporate action and there is little reason to expect that any contract entered into by a board with a fellow director however unfair would be subsequently avoided appeals from philip drunk to philip sober are not a frequent occurrence nor very fruitful but here we lack even an appealing party directors and the dominant stockholders would of course not appeal and the minority stockholders have rarely the knowledge of facts which is essential to an effective appeal whether it be made to the directors to the whole body of stockholders or to the courts besides the financial burden and the risks incident to any attempt of individual stockholders to interfere with an existing management is ordinarily prohibitive proceedings to avoid contracts with directors are therefore seldom brought except after a radical change in the membership of the board and radical changes in a board's membership are rare indeed the peugeot committee reports none of the witnesses the leading american bankers testified was able to name an instance in the history of the country in which the stockholders had succeeded in overthrowing an existing management in any large corporation 
nor does it appear that stockholders have ever even succeeded in so far as to secure the investigation of an existing management of a corporation to ascertain whether it has been well or honestly managed mr max pam proposed in the april nineteen thirteen harvard law review that the government come to the aid of minority stockholders he urged that the president of every corporation be required to report annually to the stockholders and to state and federal officials every contract made by the company in which any director is interested that the attorney general of the united states or the state investigate the same and take proper proceedings to set all such contracts aside and recover any damages suffered or without disaffirming the contracts to recover from the interested directors the profits derived therefrom and to this end also that state and national bank examiners state superintendents of insurance and the interstate commerce commission be directed to examine the records of every bank trust company insurance company railroad company and every other corporation engaged in interstate commerce mr pam's views concerning interlocking directorates are entitled to careful study as counsel prominently identified with the organization of trusts he had for years full opportunity of weighing the advantages and disadvantages of big business his conviction that the practice of interlocking directorates is a menace to the public and demands drastic legislation is significant and much can be said in support of the specific measure which he proposes but to be effective the remedy must be fundamental and comprehensive the essentials of protection protection to minority stockholders demands that corporations be prohibited absolutely from making contracts in which a director has a private interest and that all such contracts be declared not voidable merely but absolutely void in the case of railroads and public service corporations in contradistinction to private industrial companies such prohibition is demanded also in the interests of the general public for interlocking interests breed inefficiency and disloyalty and the public pays in higher rates or in poor service a large part of the penalty for graft and inefficiency indeed whether rates are adequate or excessive cannot be determined until it is known whether the gross earnings of the corporation are properly expended for when a company's important contracts are made through directors who are interested on both sides the common presumption that money spent has been properly spent does not prevail and this is particularly true in railroading where the company so often lacks effective competition in its own field but the compelling reason for prohibiting interlocking directorates is neither the protection of stockholders nor the protection of the public from incidents of inefficiency and graft conclusive evidence if obtainable that the practice of interlocking directorates benefited all stockholders and was the most efficient form of organization would not remove the objections for even more important than efficiency are industrial and political liberty and these are imperiled by the money trust interlocking directorates must be prohibited because it is impossible to break the money trust without putting an end to the practice in the larger corporations banks as public service corporations the practice of interlocking directorates is peculiarly objectionable when applied to banks because of the nature and functions of those institutions bank deposits are an important part of our currency system they are almost as essential a factor in commerce as our railways receiving deposits and making loans therefrom should be treated by the law not as a private business but as one of the public services and recognizing it to be such the law already regulates it in many ways the function of a bank is to receive and to loan money it has no more right than a common carrier to use its power specifically to build up or to destroy other businesses the granting or withholding of a loan should be determined so far as concerns the borrower solely by the interest rate and the risk involved and not by favoritism or other considerations foreign to the banking function men may safely be allowed to grant or to deny loans of their own money to whomsoever they see fit whatsoever their motive may be but bank resources are in the main not owned by the stockholders nor by the directors 
nearly three-fourths of the aggregate resources of the thirty-four banking institutions in which the Morgan Associates hold a predominant influence are represented by deposits. The dependence of commerce and industry upon bank deposits, as the common reservoir of quick capital, is so complete that deposit banking should be recognized as one of the businesses affected with a public interest and the general rule which forbids public service corporations from making unjust discriminations or giving undue preference should be applied to the operation of such banks senator owen chairman of the committee on banking and currency said recently my own judgment is that a bank is a public utility institution and cannot be treated as a private affair for the simple reason that the public is invited under the safeguards of the government to deposit its money with the bank and the public has a right to have its interests safeguarded through organized authorities. The logic of this is beyond escape. All banks in the United States, public and private, should be treated as public utility institutions where they receive public deposits. The directors and officers of banking institutions must, of course, be entrusted with wide discretion in the granting or denying of loans. But that discretion should be exercised, not only honestly as it affects stockholders, but also impartially as it affects the public. Mere honesty to the stockholders demands that the interests to be considered by the directors be the interests of all the stockholders, not the profit of the part of them who happen to be its directors. But the general welfare demands of the director, as trustee for the public, performance of a stricter duty. The fact that the granting of loans involves a delicate exercise of discretion makes it difficult to determine whether the rule of equality of treatment, which every public service corporation owes, has been performed. But that difficulty merely emphasizes the importance of making absolute the rule that banks of deposit shall not make any loan nor engage in any transaction in which a director has a private interest. And we should bear this in mind. If privately owned banks fail in the public duty to afford borrowers equality of opportunity, there will arise a demand for government-owned banks, which will become irresistible. The statement of Mr. Justice Holmes of the Supreme Court of the United States in the Oklahoma bank case is significant. We cannot say that the public interests to which we have adverted, and others, are not sufficient to warrant the state in taking the whole business of banking under its control, on the contrary, we are of the opinion that it may go on from regulation to prohibition except upon such conditions as it may prescribe. Official Precedents Nor would the requirement that banks shall make no loan in which a director has a private interest impose undue hardships or restrictions upon bank directors. It might make a bank director dispose of some of his investments and refrain from making others but it often happens that the holding of one office precludes a man from holding another, or compels him to dispose of certain financial interests. A judge is disqualified from sitting in any case in which he has even the smallest financial interest, and most judges, in order to be free to act in any matters arising in their court, proceed, upon taking office, to disclose of all investments which could conceivably bias their judgment in any matter that might come before them. An interstate commerce commissioner is prohibited from owning any bonds or stocks in any corporation subject to the jurisdiction of the commission. It is a serious criminal offense for any executive officer of the federal government to transact government business with any corporation in the pecuniary profits of which he is directly or indirectly interested. And the directors of our great banking institutions, as the ultimate judges of bank credit, exercise today a function no less important to the country's welfare than that of the judges of our courts, the interstate commerce commissioners, and department heads. Scope of the Prohibition In the proposals for legislation on this subject, four important questions are presented. 1. Shall the principle of prohibiting interlocking directorates in potentially competing corporations be applied to state banking institutions, as well as the national banks? 2. Shall it be applied to all kinds of corporations, or only to banking institutions? 3. Shall the principle of prohibiting corporations from entering into transactions in which the management has a private interest be applied to both directors and officers, or be confined in its application to officers only? 
4. Shall the principle be applied so as to prohibit transactions with another corporation in which one of its directors is interested merely as a stockholder? End of chapter 3. Recording by Kathleen Nelson, Austin, Texas, May 2010. Chapter number four of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuz, Kuz Kuzmarski. John, Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandis. Chapter four. Serve one master only. The Pujo Committee has presented the facts concerning the money trust so clearly that the conclusions appear inevitable. Their diagnosis discloses intense financial concentration and the means by which it is affected. Combination, the intertwining of interests, is shown to be the all-pervading vice of the present system. With a view to freeing industry, the committee recommends the enactment of 21 specific remedial provisions. Most of these measures are wisely framed to meet some abuse disclosed by the evidence. And if all of these were adopted, the Pujo legislation would undoubtedly alleviate present suffering and aid in arresting the disease. But many of the remedies proposed are local ones, and a cure is not possible without treatment, which is fundamental. Indeed, a major operation is necessary. This the committee has hesitated to advise, although the fundamental treatment required is simple. Serve one master only. The evils incident to interlocking directorates are, of course, fully recognized, but the prohibitions proposed in that respect are restricted to a very narrow sphere. First, the committee recognizes that potentially competing corporations should not have a common director, but it restricts this prohibition to the directors of national banks, saying, No office or director of a national bank shall be an officer or director of any other bank or of any trust company or other financial or other corporation or institution, whether organized under state or federal law, that is authorized to receive money on deposit, or that is engaged in the business of loaning money on collateral or in buying and selling securities, except as in this section provided. And no person shall be an officer or director of any national bank who is a private banker or a member of a firm or partnership of bankers that is engaged in the business of receiving deposits, provided that such bank, trust company, finance institution, banker, or firm of bankers is located at or engaged in business at or in the same city, town, or village as that in which such national bank is located or engaged in business, provided further that a director of a national bank or a partner of such directory may be an officer or director of not more than one trust company organized by the laws of the state in which such national bank is engaged in business and doing business at the same place. Second, the committee recognizes that a corporation should not make a contract in which one of the management has a private interest, but it restricts this prohibition, one, to national banks, and two, to the officers, saying, No national bank shall lend or advance money or credit or purchase or discount any promissory note, draft, bill of exchange, or other evidence of debt bearing the signature or endorsement of any of its officers or of any partnership of which such officer is a member, directly or indirectly or of any corporation in which such officer owns or has a beneficial interest of upward of 10 per centum of the capital stock, or lend or advance money or credit to, for, on behalf of any such officer, or of any such partnership or corporation, or purchase any security from any such officer, or 
of or from any partnership or corporation of which such officer is a member or in which he is financially interested as herein specified or of any corporation of which any of its officers is an officer at the time of such transaction prohibitions of intertwining relations so restricted however supplemented by other provisions will not end financial concentration the money trust snake will at most be scotched not killed the prohibition of a common director in potentially competing corporations should apply to state banks and trust companies as well as to national banks and it should apply to railroad and industrial corporations as fully as to banking institutions the prohibition of corporate contracts in which one of the management has a private interest should apply to directors as well as to officers and to state banks and to trust companies and to other classes of corporations as well as to national banks and as will be hereafter shown such broad legislation is within the power of congress let us examine this further the prohibition of common directors in potentially competing corporations. 1. National banks. The objection to common directors as applied to banking institutions is clearly shown by the Pujo Committee. As the first and foremost step in applying a remedy, and also for reasons that seem to us conclusive, independently of that consideration, we must recommend that interlocking directorates in potentially competing financial institutions be abolished and prohibited so far as lies in the power of congress to bring about that result when we find as in a number of instances the same man a director in half a dozen or more banks and trust companies all located in the same section of the same city doing the same class of business and with a like set of associates similarly situated all belonging to the same group and representing the same class of interests all further pretense of competition is useless if banks serving the same field are to be permitted to have common directors genuine competition will be rendered impossible besides this practice gives to such common directors the unfair advantage of knowing the affairs of borrowers in various banks and thus affords endless opportunities for oppression this recommendation is in accordance with the legislation or practice of other countries the bank of england the bank of france the national bank of belgium and the leading banks of scotland all exclude from their boards persons who are directors in other banks by law in russia no person is allowed to be on the board of management of more than one bank the committee's recommendation is also in harmony with laws enacted by the commonwealth of massachusetts more than a generation ago designed to curb financial concentration through the savings banks of the great wealth of massachusetts a large part is represented by deposits in savings banks these deposits are distributed among 194 different banks located in 131 different cities and towns. These 194 banks are separate and distinct, not only in form, but in fact. In order that the banks may not be controlled by a few financiers, the Massachusetts law provides that no executive officer or trustee director of any savings bank can hold any office in any other savings bank that statute was passed in 1876 a few years ago it was supplemented by providing that none of the executive officers of a savings bank could hold a similar office in any national bank massachusetts attempted this to curb the power of the individual financier and no disadvantages are discernible when that act was passed the aggregate deposits in its savings banks were two hundred and forty three million three hundred forty thousand six hundred forty two the number of deposit accounts seven hundred thirty nine thousand two hundred eighty nine the average deposit to each person of the population one hundred and forty four dollars 
On November 1st, 1912, the aggregate deposits were 838,635,097.85. and 85 cents. The number of deposit accounts 2,200,917. The average deposit to each account $381.04. Massachusetts has shown that curbing the power of the few, at least in this respect, is entirely consistent with efficiency and with the prosperity of the whole people. 2. State banks and trust companies. The reason for prohibiting common directors in banking institutions applies equally to national banks and to state banks, including those trust companies, which are essentially banks. In New York City, there are 37 trust companies, of which only 15 are members of the clearinghouse. But those 15 had, on November 2nd, 1912, aggregate resources of $827,875,653. Indeed, the Bankers Trust Company, with resources of... 205 million and the guarantee trust company with resources of 232 million are among the most useful tools of the money trust no bank in the country has larger deposits than the latter and only one bank larger deposits than the former if common dictatorships were permitted in state banks or such trust companies the charters of leading national banks would doubtless soon be surrendered, and the institutions would elude federal control by reincorporating under state laws. The Pujo Committee has failed to apply the prohibition of common dictatorships in potentially competing banking institutions rigorously even to national banks. It permits the same man to be a director in one national bank and one trust company doing business in the same place. The proposed concession opens the door to grave dangers. In the first place, the provision would permit the interlocking of any national bank, not with one trust company only, but with as many trust companies as the bank has directors. For, while under the Pujo bill, no one can be a national bank director who is director in more than one such trust company. There is nothing to prevent each of the directors of a bank from becoming a director in a different trust company. The National Bank of Commerce of New York has a board of 38 directors. There are 37 trust companies in the city of New York. 37 of the 38 directors might each become a director of a different New York trust company, and thus 37 trust companies would be interlocked with the National Bank of Commerce, unless the other recommendation of the Pujo Committee, limiting the number of directors to 13, were also adopted. But even if the bill were amended as to limit the possible interlocking of a bank to a single trust company, the wisdom of the concession would still be doubtful. It is true, as the Pujo Committee states, that the business that may be transacted by a trust company is of a different character from that properly transacted by a national bank. But the business actually conducted by a trust company is, at least in the East, quite similar and the two classes of banking institutions have these vital elements in common. Each is a bank of deposit, and each make loans from its deposits. A private banker may also transact some business of a character different from that properly conducted by a bank. But, by the terms of the committee's bill, a private banker engaged in the business of receiving deposits would be prevented from being a director of a national bank, and the reasons underlying that prohibition apply equally to trust companies and to private bankers. 3. Other Corporations The interlocking of banking institutions is only one of the factors which have developed the money trust. The interlocking of other corporations has been an equally important element and the prohibition of interlocking directorates should be extended to potentially competing corporations, whatever the class, to life insurance companies, railroads, and industrial companies, as well as banking institutions.
the pucho committee has shown that mr george f baker is a common director in the six railroads which haul eighty per cent of all anthracite marketed and own eighty eight per cent of all anthracite deposits the morgan associates are the nexus between such supposedly competing railroads as the northern pacific and the great northern the southern the louisville and nashville and the atlantic coastline and between partially competing industrials like the westinghouse electric and manufacturing company and the general electric the nexus between all the large potentially competing corporations must be severed if the money trust is to be broken prohibiting corporate contracts in which the management has a private interest the principle of prohibiting corporate contracts in which the management has a private interest is applied in the pujo committee's recommendations only to national banks and in them only to officers all other corporations are to be permitted to continue the practice and even in national banks the directors are to be free to have a conflicting private interest except that they must not accept compensation for promoting a loan of bank funds nor participate in syndicates promotions or underwriting of securities in which their banks may be interested as underwriters or owners or lenders thereon that all loans or other transactions in which a director is interested shall be made in his own name and shall be authorized only after ample notice to co-directors and that the facts shall be spread upon the records of the corporation the money trust would not be disturbed by a prohibition limited to authors under a law of that character financial control would continue to be exercised by the few without substantial impairment but the power would be exerted through a somewhat different channel bank officers are appointees of the directors and ordinarily their obedient servants individuals who as bank officers are now important factors in the financial concentration would doubtless resign as officers and become merely directors the loss of official salaries involved could be easily compensated no member of the firm of j p morgan and co is an officer in any one of the thirteen banking institutions with aggregate resources of one billion two hundred eighty three million through which as many directors they carry on their vast operations a prohibition limited to officers would not affect the morgan operations with these banking institutions if there were minority representation on bank boards which the pujo community wisely advocates such a provision might afford some protection to stockholders through the vigilance of the minority directors preventing the dominant directors using their power to the injury of the minority stockholders but even then the provision would not safeguard the public and the primary purpose of money trust legislation is not to prevent directors from injuring stockholders but to prevent their injuring the public through the intertwined control of the banks no prohibition limited to officers will materially change this condition the prohibition of interlocking directorates even if applied only to all banks and trust companies would practically compel the morgan representatives to resign from the directorates of the thirteen banking institutions with which they are connected or from the directorates of all the railroads express steamship public utility manufacturing and other corporations which do business with those banks and trust companies whether they resigned from the one or the other class of corporations the endless chain would be broken into many pieces and whether they retired or not the morgan power would obviously be greatly lessened for if they did not retire their field of operations would be greatly narrowed apply the private interest prohibition to all kinds of corporations 
The creation of the money trust is due quite as much to the encroachment of the investment banker upon railroads, public service, industrial, and life insurance companies as to the control of banks and trust companies. Before the money trust can be broken, all these relations must be severed, and they cannot be severed unless corporations of each of these several classes are prevented from dealing with their own directors and with corporations in which those directors are interested. For instance, the most potent single source of J.P. Morgan and Co.'s power is the 100 and sixty two million five hundred thousand deposits, including those of seventy eight interstate railroad, public service, and industrial corporations, which the Morgan firm is free to use as it sees fit. The proposed prohibition, even if applied to all banking institutions, would not affect directly this great source of Morgan power. If, however, the prohibition is made to include railroad, public service, and industrial corporations, as well as banking institutions, members of J.P. Morgan & Co. will quickly retire from substantially all boards of directors. Apply the private interest prohibition to stockholding interests. The prohibition against one corporation entering into transactions with another corporation in which one of its directors is also interested should apply even if his interest in the second corporation is merely that of stockholder. A conflict of interests in a director may be just as serious where he is a stockholder only in the second corporation as if he were also a director. One of the annoying petty monopolies concerning which evidence was taken by the Pujo Committee is the exclusive privilege granted to the American Bank Note Company by the New York Stock Exchange. A recent $60 million issued of New York City bonds was denied listing on the exchange because the city refused to submit to an exaction of $55,800 by the American company for engraving the bonds when the New York Bank Note Company would do the work equally well for $44,500. As tending to explain this extraordinary monopoly, it was shown that men prominent in the financial world were stockholders in the American company. Amongst the largest stockholders was Mr. Morgan with 6,000 shares. No member of the Morgan firm was a director of the American company, but there was sufficient influence exerted somehow to give the American company the stock exchange monopoly. The Pujo Committee, while failing to recommend that transactions in which a director has a private interest be prohibited, recognizes that a stockholder's interest of more than a certain size may be as potent an instrument of influence as a direct personal interest, for it recommends that borrowings directly or indirectly by any corporation of the stock of which he, a bank director, holds upwards of 10% from the bank of which he is such director should only be permitted on condition that notice shall have been given to his co-directors, and that a full statement of the transaction shall be entered upon the minutes of the meeting at which such loan was authorized. As shown above, the particular provision for notice affords no protection to the public, but if it did, its application ought to be extended to lesser stock holdings. Indeed, it is difficult to fix a limit so low that Financial interest will not influence action. Certainly, a stockholding interest of a single director, much smaller than 10%, might be most effective in inducing favors. Mr. Morgan's stock holdings in the American Bank Note Company was only 3%. The $6 million investment of J.P. Morgan & Co. in the National City Bank represented only 6% of the bank stock and would undoubtedly have been effective even if it had not been supplemented 
by the election of his son to the board of directors. Special Disqualifications The Stanley Committee, after investigation of the Steel Trust, concluded that the evils of interlocking directorates were so serious that representatives of certain industries which are largely dependent upon railroads should be absolutely prohibited from serving as railroad directors, officers, or employees. It, therefore, proposed to disqualify as railroad director, officer, or employee any person engaged in the business of manufacturing or selling railroad cars or locomotives, railroad rail or structural steel, or in mining and selling coal. The drastic Stanley bill shows how great is the desire to do away with present abuses and to lessen the power of the money trust. Directors, officers, and employees of banking institutions should, by a similar provision, be disqualified from acting as directors, officers, or employees of life insurance companies. The Armstrong investigation showed that life insurance companies were, in 1905, the most potent factor in financial concentration. Their power was exercised largely through the banks and trust companies which they controlled by stock ownership and their huge deposits. The Armstrong legislation directed life insurance companies to sell their stocks. The mutual life and the equitable did so in part. But the Morgan Associates bought the stocks and now instead of the life insurance companies controlling the banks and trust companies the latter and the bankers control the life insurance companies how the prohibition may be limited the money trust cannot be destroyed unless all classes of corporations are included in the prohibition of interlocking directors and of transactions by corporations in which the management has a private interest. But it does not follow that the prohibition must apply to every corporation of each class. Certain exceptions are entirely consistent with merely protecting the public against the money trust. Although protection of minority stockholders and business ethics demand that the rule prohibiting a corporation from making contracts in which a director has a private financial interest should be universal in its application. The number of corporations in the United States, December 31st, 1912, was 305,336. Of these, only 1,610 have a capital of more than $5 million. Few corporations, other than banks, with a capital of less than $5 million, could appreciably affect general credit conditions, either through their own operations or their affiliations. Corporations, other than banks, with capital resources of less than $5 million, might, therefore, be excluded from the scope of the statute for the present. The prohibition could also be limited so as not to apply to any industrial concern, regardless of the amount of capital and resources, doing only an interstate business. As practically all large industrial corporations are engaged in interstate commerce. This would exclude some retail concerns and local jobbers and manufacturers not otherwise excluded from the operation of the act. Likewise, banks and trust companies located in cities of less than 100,000 inhabitants might, if thought advisable, be excluded. For the present, if their capital is less than $500,000 and their resources less than, say, $2,500,000. In larger cities, even the smaller banking institutions should be subject to the law. Such exceptions should overcome any objection which might be raised that in some smaller cities the prohibition of interlocking directorates would exclude from the bank directorates all the able businessmen of the community through fear of losing the opportunity of bank accommodations. 
an exception should also be made so as to permit interlocking directorates between a corporation and its proper subsidiaries and the prohibition of transactions in which the management has a private interest should of course not apply to contracts express or implied for such services as are performed indiscriminately for the whole community by railroads and public service corporations or for services common to all customers like the ordinary service of a bank for its depositors the power of congress the question may be asked has congress the power to impose these limitations upon the conduct of any business other than national banks and if the power of congress is so limited will not the dominant financiers upon the enactment of such a law convert their national banks into state banks or trust companies and thus escape from congressional control the answer to both questions is clear congress has ample power to impose such prohibitions upon practically all corporations including state banks trust companies and life insurance companies and evasion may be made impossible while congress has not been granted power to regulate directly state banks and trust or life insurance companies or railroad public service and industrial corporations except in respect to interstate commerce it may do so indirectly by virtue either of its control of the mail privilege or through the taxing power practically no business in the united states can be conducted without use of the mails and congress may in its reasonable discretion deny the use of the mail to any business which is conducted under conditions deemed by congress to be injurious to the public welfare thus congress has no power directly to suppress lotteries but it has indirectly suppressed them by de denying under heavy penalty the use of the mail to lottery enterprises congress has no power to suppress directly business frauds but it is constantly doing so indirectly by issuing fraud orders denying the mail privilege congress has no direct power to require a newspaper to publish a list of its proprietors and the amount of its circulation or to require it to mark paid matter distinctly as advertising but it has thus regulated the press by denying the second class mail privilege to all publications which fail to comply with the requirements prescribed the taxing power has been restored to by congress for like purposes congress has no power to regulate the manufacture of matches or the use of oleomargarine but it has suppressed the manufacture of the white phosphorus match and has thus greatly lessened the use of oleomargarine by imposing heavy taxes upon them congress has no power to prohibit or to regulate directly the issue of banknotes by state banks but it indirectly prohibited their issue by imposing a tax of ten per cent upon any banknote issued by a state bank the power of congress over interstate commerce has been similarly utilized congress cannot ordinarily provide compensation for accidents to employees or undertake directly to suppress prostitution but it has as an incident of regulating interstate commerce enacted the railroad employers liability law and the white slave law and it has full power over the instrumentalities of commerce like the telegraph and the telephone as such exercise of congressional power has been common for at least half a century congress should not hesitate now to employ it where its exercise is urgently needed for a comprehensive prohibition of interlocking directorates is an essential condition of our attaining the new freedom such a law would involve a great change in the relation of the leading banks and bankers to other businesses but it is the very purpose of money trust legislation to effect a great change and unless it does so the power of our financial oligarchy cannot be broken but though the enactment of such a law is essential to the emancipation of business it will not alone restore industrial liberty 
it must be supplemented by other remedial measures. End of chapter 4 Recording by John Thomas Kuzmarski John Thomas Kuz, John K. Thomas www.validateyourlife.com or johnkuz.com Chapter number five of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Coons Kuzmarski. John. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandis. Chapter five. What Publicity Can Do. Publicity is justly commended as a remedy for social and industrial diseases. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, electric light the most efficient policeman, and publicity has already played an important part in the struggle against the money trust. The Pujo community has, in the disclosure of the facts concerning financial concentration, made a most important contribution toward attainment of the new freedom. The battlefield has been surveyed and charted. The hostile forces have been located, counted, and appraised. That was a necessary first step, and a long one, towards relief. The provisions in the committee's bill concerning the incorporation of stock exchanges and the statement to be made in connection with the listing of securities would doubtless have a beneficent effect. But there should be a further call upon publicity for service, that potent force must, in the impending struggle, be utilized in many ways as a continuous remedial measure. Wealth. Combination and control of other people's money and of other people's businesses. These are the main factors in the development of the money trust. But the wealth of the investment banker is also a factor. And with the extraordinary growth of his wealth in recent years, the relative importance of wealth as a factor in financial concentration has grown steadily. It was wealth which enabled Mr. Morgan, in 1910, to pay $3 million for $51,000 par value of the stock of the Equitable Life Insurance Society. His direct income from this investment was limited by law to less than one-eighth of one percent a year but it gave legal control of $504 million of assets. It was wealth which enabled the Morgan Associates to buy from the Equitable and the Mutual Life Insurance Company the stocks in the several banking institutions which merged in the Bankers Trust Company and the Guarantee Trust Company. It gave the control of $357 million deposits. It was wealth which enabled Mr. Morgan to acquire his shares in the first national and national city banks worth $21 million, through which he cemented the triple alliance with those institutions. Now, how has this great wealth been accumulated? Some of it was natural accretion. Some of it is due to special opportunities for investment wisely availed of. Some of it is due to the vast extent of the banker's operations. Then power breeds wealth as wealth breeds power. But a main cause of these large fortunes is the huge tolls taken by those who control the avenues to capital and to investors. There has been exacted as toll literally all that the traffic will bear. Excessive bankers' commissions. The Pujo Committee was unfortunately prevented by a lack of time from presenting to the country the evidence covering the amounts taken by the investment bankers as promoters' fees, underwriting commissions, and profits. Nothing could have demonstrated so clearly the power exercised by the bankers as a schedule showing the aggregate of these taxes levied within recent years. It would be well worth while now to reopen the money trust investigation merely to collect these data. But earlier investigations have disclosed some illuminating those sporadic facts. The syndicate which promoted the steel trust took, as compensation for a few weeks' work, securities yielding 
$62,500,000 in cash, and of this J.P. Morgan & Company received for their services as syndicate managers $12,500,000, besides their shares as syndicate subscribers in the remaining $50 million. The Morgan Syndicate took for promoting the Tube Trust $20 million common stock out of a total issue of $80 million stock, preferred and common. Nor were monster commissions limited to trust promotions. More recently, bankers' syndicates have, in many instances, received for floating preferred stocks of recapitalized industrial concerns one-third of all common stock issued besides a considerable sum in cash and for the sale of preferred stock of well-established manufacturing concerns cash commissions or profits of from seven and a half to ten percent of the cash raised are often exacted on bonds of high-class industrial concerns, bankers' commissions or profits of from 5 to 10 points have been common. Nor have these heavy charges been confined to industrial concerns. Even railroad securities, supposedly of high grade, have been subjected to like burdens. At a time when the New Haven's credit was still unimpaired j p morgan and company took the new york worcester and boston railway first mortgage bonds guaranteed by the new haven at ninety two and a half and they were marketed at ninety six and a quarter they took the portland terminal company bonds guaranteed by the main central railroad a corporation of unquestionable credit at about eighty eight and these were marketed at ninety two a large part of these underwriting commissions is taken by the great banking houses, not for their services in selling the bonds nor in assuming risks, but for securing others to sell the bonds and incur risks. Thus, when the Interboro Railway, a most prosperous corporation, financed its recent $170 million bond issue, J.P. Morgan & Company, received a 3% commission, that is $5,100,000, practically for arranging that others should underwrite and sell the bonds. The aggregate commissions or profits so taken by leading banking houses can only be conjectured as the full amount of their transactions has not been disclosed and the rate of commission or profit varies very widely, but the Pujo Committee has supplied some interesting data bearing upon the subject. Counting the issues of securities of interstate corporations only, J.P. Morgan & Company directly procured the public marketing alone or in conjunction with others during the years 1902 to 1912 of $1,950,000,000. What the average commission or profit taken by J.P. Morgan & Company was, we do not know. But we do know that every 1% on that sum yields $19,500,000. It even that huge aggregate of $1,950,000,000 includes only a part of the securities on which commissions or profits were paid. It does not include any issue of an intrastate corporation. It does not include any securities privately marketed. It does not include any government, state, or municipal bonds. It is to exactions such as these that the wealth of the investment banker is in large part due. And since this wealth is an important factor in the creation of the power exercised by the money trust, we must endeavor to put an end to this improper wealth getting as well as to improper combination. The money trust is so powerful and so firmly entrenched that each of the sources of its undue power must be effectually stopped if we would attain the new freedom. How shall excessive charges be stopped? The Pujo Committee recommends, as a remedy for such excessive charges, that interstate corporations be prohibited from entering into any agreements creating a sole fiscal agent to dispose of their security issues, that the issue of the securities of interstate railroads be placed under the super 
vision of the Interstate Commerce Commission, and that their securities should be disposed of only upon public or private competitive bids, or under regulations to be prescribed by the Commission, with full powers of investigation that will discover and punish combinations which prevent competition in bidding. Some of the state public service commissions now exercise such power, and it may possibly be wise to confer this power upon the Interstate Commission, although the recommendation of the Hadley Railroad Securities Commission are to the contrary. But the official regulation, as proposed by the Pujo Committee, would be confined to railroad corporations, and the new security issues of other corporations listed in the New York Stock Exchange have aggregated in the last five years. Four billion five hundred twenty five million four hundred four thousand twenty five dollars, which is more than either the railroad or the municipal issues. Publicity offers, however, another and even more promising remedy, a method of regulating bankers' charges, which would apply automatically to railroad, public service, and industrial corporations alike. The question may be asked, why have these excessive charges been submitted to? Corporations, which in the first instance bear the charges for capital, have doubtless submitted because of banker control, exercised directly through interlocking directorates or kindred relations, and directly through combinations among bankers to suppress competition. But why have the investors submitted, since ultimately all these charges are borne by the investors, except so far as corporations succeed in shifting the burden upon the community? The large army of small investors constituting a substantial majority of all security buyers, are entirely free from banker control. Their submission is undoubtedly due in part to the fact that the bankers control the avenues to recognizably safe investments almost as fully as they do the avenues to capital. But the investors' servility is due partly also to this ignorance of the facts. It is not probable that, if each investor knew the extent to which the security he buys from the banker is diluted by excessive underwritings, commissions, and profits, there would be a strike of capital against these unjust exactions. The strike of capital. A recent British experience supports this view. In a brief period, last spring, nine different issues aggregating $135,840,000 were offered by syndicates on the London market, and on the average, only about 10% of these loans was taken by the public. Money was tight, but the rates of interest offered were very liberal, and no one doubted that the investors were well supplied with funds. The London Daily Mail presented an explanation. The long series of rebuffs to new loans at the hands of investors reached a climax in the ill success of the great Rothschild issue. It will remain a topic of financial discussion for many days, and many in the city are expressing the opinion that it may have a revolutionary effect upon the present system of loan issuing and underwriting. The question being discussed is that the public have become loth to subscribe for stock which they believe the underwriters can afford, by reason of the commission they receive, to sell subsequently at a lower price than the issue price, and that the stock exchange has begun to realize the public's attitude. The public sees in the underwriter not so much one who ensures that the loan shall be subscribed in return for its commission as a middleman who, as it were, has an opportunity of obtaining stock at a lower price than the public in order that he may pass it off at profit subsequently, they prefer not to subscribe but to await an opportunity of dividing that profit. They feel that if, when the issues were made, the stock were offered them 
at a more attractive price, there would be less need to pay the underwriter so high commissions. It is another practical protest, if indirect, against the existence of the middleman, which protest is one of the features of present-day finance. Publicity as a remedy. Compel bankers, when issuing securities, to make public the commissions or profits they are receiving. Let every circular letter, prospectus, or advertisement of a bond or stock show clearly what the banker received for his middleman services and what the bonds and stocks net the issuing corporation. This is knowledge to which both the existing security holder and the prospective purchaser is fairly entitled. If the banker's compensation is reasonable, considering the skill and risk involved, there can be no objection to making it known. If it is not reasonable, the investor will strike, as investors seem to have done recently in England. Such disclosures of bankers' commissions or profits is demanded also for another reason. It will aid the investor in judging of the safety of the investment. In the marketing of securities, there are two classes of risk. One is the risk whether the banker or the corporation will find ready purchasers for the bonds or stock at the issue price. The other, whether the investor will get a good article. The maker of the security and the banker are interested chiefly in getting it sold at the issue price. The investor is interested chiefly in buying a good article. The small investor relies almost exclusively upon the banker for his knowledge and judgment as to the quality of the security, and it is this which makes his relation to the banker one of confidence. But at present, the investment banker occupies a position inconsistent with that relation. The banker's compensation should, of course, vary according to the risk he assumes. Where there is a large risk that the bonds or stock will not be promptly sold at the issue price, the underwriting commission, that is the insurance premium, should be correspondingly large. But the banker ought not to be paid more for getting investors to assume a larger risk. In practice, the banker gets the higher commission for underwriting the weaker security, on the ground that his own risk is greater. And the weaker the security, the greater is the banker's incentive to induce his customers to relieve him. Now the law should not undertake, except incidentally in connection with railroads and public service corporations, to fix bankers' profits, and it should not seek to prevent investors from making bad margins. It is now recognized in the simplest merchandising that there should be full disclosures. The archaic doctrine of caveat emptor is vanishing. The law has begun to require publicity in aid of fair dealing. The federal Pure food law does not guarantee quality or prices, but helps the buyer to judge of quality by requiring disclosure of ingredients. Among the most important facts to be learned for determining the real value of a security is the amount of water it contains, and any excessive amount paid to the banker for marketing a security is water. Require a full disclosure to the investor of the amount of commissions and profits paid, not only will investors be put on their guard, but bankers' compensation will tend to adjust itself automatically to what is fair and reasonable. Excessive commissions, thus form of unjustly acquired wealth, will in large part cease. Real disclosure. But the disclosure must be real, and it must be a disclosure to the investor. It will not suffice to require merely the filing of a statement of facts with the commissioner of corporations or with a score of other officials, federal and state. That would be almost as ineffective as if the pure food law required a manufacturer merely to deposit with the department a statement of ingredients instead of requiring the label to tell the story. Nor would the filing of a full statement with the stock exchange, if incorporated, as provided by the Pujo Committee Bill, be adequate. To be effective, knowledge of the facts must be actually brought home to the investor, and this can best be done by requiring the facts to be stated in good, large type in every notice, circular, letter, 
an advertisement inviting the investor to purchase. Compliance with this requirement should also be obligatory, and not something which the investor could waive. For the whole public is interested in putting an end to the banker's exactions. England undertook years ago to protect its investors against the wiles of promoters by requiring a somewhat similar disclosure. But the British Act failed, in large measure of its purpose, partly because under it the statement of facts was filed only with a public official, and partly because the investor could waive the provision, and the British statute has now been changed in the latter respect. Disclose Syndicate Particulars The required publicity should also include a disclosure of all participants in underwriting. It is a common incident of underwriting that no member of the syndicate shall sell at less than the syndicate price for a definite period, unless the syndicate is sooner dissolved. In other words, the bankers make by agreement an artificial price. Often the agreement is probably illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Law. This price maintenance is, however, not necessarily objectionable. It may be entirely consistent with the general welfare, if the facts are made known. But disclosure should include a list of those participating in the underwriting, so that the public may not be misled. The investor should know whether his advisor is disinterested. Not long ago, a member of a leading banking house was undertaking to justify a commission taken by his firm for floating a now favorite preferred stock of a manufacturing concern. The bankers took for their services $250,000 in cash besides one-third of the common stock, amounting to about $2 million. Of course, he said, that would have been too much if we could have kept it all for ourselves, but we couldn't. We had to divide up a large part. There were 57 participants. Why? We had even to give $10,000 of stock, too, and said he didn't know. We might have lost many a com customer for the stock. We had to give him $10,000 of the stock to teach him not to shrug his shoulders. Think of the effectiveness with practical Americans of a statement like this. A, B, and Company. Investment Bankers. We have today secured substantial control of the successful machinery business heretofore conducted by blank at blank, Illinois, which has been incorporated under the name of the Excelsior Manufacturing Company with a capital of $10 million, of which $5 million is preferred and $5 million common. As we have a large clientele of confining customers, we were able to secure from the owners an agreement for marketing the preferred stock. We to fix a price which shall net the owners in cash $95 a share. We offer this excellent stock to you at $100.75 per share. Our own commission or profit will be only a little over $5 per share or say $250,000 cash besides $1,500,000 of the common stock, which we received as a bonus. This cash and stock commission we are to divide in various proportions with the following participants in the underwriting syndicate. C.D. and Company, New York. E.F. and Company, Boston. L.M. and Company, Philadelphia. I.K. and Company, New York. O.P. and Company, Chicago. Were such notices common, the investment bankers would be worthy of their hire, for only reasonable compensation would ordinarily be taken. For marketing, the preferred stock, as in the case of Excelsior Manufacturing Co., referred to above, investment bankers were doubtless essential, and as middlemen, they performed a useful service. But they used their strong position to make an excessive charge. They are, however, many cases where the banker's services can be altogether dispensed with, and where that is possible, he should be eliminated, not only for the economy's sake, 
but to break up financial concentration. End of chapter 5. Recording by John K. Thomas, John Thomas Kuz Kosmarski. John. Chapter number six of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John. K. Thomas, John Thomas Cooks, is Marshall, John Thomas Cooks. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandis. Chapter six. Where the banker is superfluous. The abolition of interlocking directorates will greatly curtail the banker's power by putting an end to many improper combinations. Publicity concerning bankers' commissions, profits, and associates will lend effective aid, particularly by curbing undue exactions. Many of the specific measures recommended by the Puto Committee, some of them dealing with technical details, will go far toward correcting corporate and banking abuses and thus tend to arrest financial concentration. But the investment banker has, within his legitimate province, acquired control so extensive as to menace the public welfare even where his business is properly conducted. If the new freedom is to be attained, every proper means of lessening that power must be availed of. A simple and effective remedy, which can be widely applied even without new legislation, lies near at hand. Eliminate the banker middleman where he is superfluous. Today, practically all governments, states, and municipalities pay toll to the banker on all bonds sold. Why should they? It is not because the banker is always needed. It is because the banker controls the only avenue through which the investor in bonds and stocks can ordinarily be reached. The banker has become the universal tax gatherer. True, the pro rata of taxes levied by him upon our state and city governments is less than that levied by him upon the corporations. But few states or cities escape payment of some such tax to the banker on every loan it makes. Even where the new issues of bonds are sold at public auction or to the highest bidder on sealed proposals, the banker's syndicates usually secure large blocks of the bonds which are sold to the people at a considerable profit. The middleman, even though unnecessary, collects his tribute. There is a legitimate field for dealers in the state and municipal bonds. As for other merchants, investors already owning such bonds must have a medium through which they can sell their holdings. And those states or municipalities which lack an established reputation among investors or which must seek more distant markets need the banker to distribute new issues. But there are many states and cities which have an established reputation and have a home market at hand. These should sell their bonds direct to investors without the intervention of middlemen. And as like conditions prevail with some corporations, their bonds and stocks should also be sold direct to the investor. Both financial efficiency and industrial liberty demand that the banker's toll be abolished where that is possible. Banker and Broker The business of the investment banker must not be confused with that of the bond and stockbroker. The two are often combined, but the functions are essentially different. The broker performs a very limited service. He has properly nothing to do with the original issue of securities, nor with their introduction to the market. He merely negotiates a purchase or sale as agent for another under specific orders. He exercises no discretion except in the method of bringing buyer and seller together or of executing orders. For his humble service, he receives a moderate compensation, a commission, usually one-eighth of one percent, twelve and one-half cents for each one hundred dollars, on the par value of the security sold. The investment banker also is a mere middleman. But he is a principal, not an agent. He is also a merchant in bonds and stocks. The compensation received for his part in the transaction is, in many cases, 
more accurately described as profit than as commission so far as concerns new issues of government state and municipal bonds especially he acts as merchant buying and selling securities on his own behalf buying commonly at wholesale from the maker and selling at retail to the investors taking the merchant's risk and the merchant's profits on purchases of corporate securities the profits are often very large but even a large profit may be entirely proper for when the banker's services are needed and are properly performed they are of great value on purchases of government state and municipal securities the profit is usually smaller but even a very small profit cannot be justified if necessary how the banker can serve the banker's services include three distinct functions and only three first specifically as expert the investment banker has the responsibility of the ordinary retailer to sell only that merchandise which is good of its kind but his responsibility in this respect is unusually heavy because he deals in an article on which a great majority of his customers are unable themselves to pass intelligent judgment without aid the purchase by the investor of most corporate securities is little better than a gamble where he fails to get the advice of someone who has investigated security thoroughly as the banker should for few investors have the time the facilities or the ability to investigate properly the value of corporate securities second specifically as distributor the banker performs an all-important service in providing an outlet for securities his connections enable him to reach possible buyers quickly and goodwill that is possession of the confidence of regular customers enables him to affect sales where the maker of the security might utterly fail to find a market third specifically as jobber or retailer the investment banker like other merchants carries his stock in trade until it can be marketed in this he performs a service which is often of great value to the maker needed cash is obtained immediately because the whole issue of securities can thus be disposed of by a single transaction and even where there is not immediate payment the knowledge that the money will be provided when needed is often of paramount importance by carrying securities in stock the banker performs a service also to investors who are thereby enabled to buy securities at such times as they desire whenever makers of securities or investors require all or any of these three services the investment banker is needed and payment of compensation to him is proper where there is no such need the banker is clearly superfluous and in respect to the original issue of many of our state and municipal bonds and of some corporate securities no such need exists where the banker serves not it needs no banker experts in the value to tell us that the bonds of massachusetts or new york of boston philadelphia or baltimore and of scores of lesser american cities are safe investments the basic financial facts in regards two such bonds are a part of the common knowledge of many american investors and certainly of most possible investors who reside in the particular state or city whose bonds are in question where the financial facts are not generally known they are so simple that they can be easily summarized and understood by any prospective investor without interpretation by an expert bankers often employ before purchasing securities their own accountants to verify the statements supplied by the makers of the security and use these accountants certificates as an aid in selling states and municipalities the makers of the securities might for the same purpose employ independent public accountants of high reputation who would give their certificates for use in marketing the securities investors could also be assured without banker aid that the basic legal conditions are sound 
bankers before purchasing an issue of securities customarily obtain their own counsel an opinion as to its legality which investors are invited to examine it would answer the same purpose if states and municipalities should supplement the opinion of their legal representatives by that of independent counsel of recognized professional standing who would certify to the legality of the issue neither should an investment banker be needed to find investors willing to take up in small lots a new issue of bonds of new york or massachusetts of boston philadelphia or baltimore or a hundred other american cities a state or municipality seeking to market direct to the investor its own bonds would naturally experience at the outset some difficulty in marketing a large issue and in a newer community where there is little accumulation of unemployed capital it might be possible to find buyers for any large issue investors are apt to be conservative and they have been trained to regard the intervention of the banker as necessary the bankers would naturally discourage any attempt of states and cities to dispense with their services entrance upon a market hitherto monopolized by them would usually have to be struggled for but banker fed investors as well as others could in time be brought to realize the advantage of avoiding the middleman and dealing directly with responsible borrowers governments like private concerns would have to do educational work but this publicity would be much less expensive and much more productive than that undertaken by the bankers many investors are already impatient of banker exactions and eager to deal directly with governmental agencies in whom they have more confidence and a great demand could at once be developed among smaller investors whom the bankers have been unable to interest and who now never buy state or municipal bonds the opening of this new field would furnish a market in some respects more desirable and certainly wider than that now reached by the bankers neither do states or cities ordinarily need the services of the investment banker to carry their bonds pending distribution to the investor where there is immediate need for large funds states and cities at least the older communities should be able to raise the money temporarily quite as well as the bankers do now while awaiting distribution of their bonds to the investor bankers carry the bonds with other people's money not with their own why should not cities get the temporary use of other people's money as well bankers have the preferential use of the deposits in the banks often because they control the banks free these institutions from banker control and no applicant to borrow the people's money will be received with greater favor than our large cities boston with its one billion five hundred million dollars of assessed valuation and seventy eight million thirty three thousand one hundred twenty eight dollars net net is certainly as good a risk as even lee higginson and co or kidder peabody and co but ordinarily cities do not or should not require large sums of money at any one time such need of large sums does not arise except from time to time where maturing loans are to be met or when some existing public utility plant is to be taken over from private owners large issues of bonds for any other purpose are usually made in anticipation of future needs rather than to meet present necessities modern efficient public financiering through substituting serial bonds for the long-term issues which in massachusetts has been made obligatory will in time remove the need of large sums at one time for paying maturing debts since each year's maturities will be paid from the year's taxes purchases of existing public utility plants are of rare occurrence and are apt to be preceded by long periods of negotiation 
when they occur they can if foresight be exercised usually be financed without full cash payment at one time Today, when a large issue of bonds is made, the banker, while ostensibly paying his own money to the city, actually pays to the city other people's money which he has borrowed from the banks. Then the banks get back, through the city's deposit, a large part of the money so received. And when the money is returned to the bank, the banker has the opportunity of borrowing it again for other operations. The process results in double loss to the city. The city loses by not getting from the banks as much for its bonds as investors would pay, and then it loses interest on the money raised before it is needed. For the bankers receive from the city bonds bearing rarely less than 4% interest, while the proceeds are deposited in the banks, which rarely allow more than 2% interest in the daily balances. Cities that have helped themselves. In the present year, some cities have been led by necessity to help themselves. The bond market was poor. Business was uncertain, money tight, and the ordinary investor reluctant. Bankers were loth to take new bond issues. Municipalities were unwilling to pay the high rates demanded of them, and many cities were prohibited by law or ordinance from paying more than 4% interest while good municipal bonds were selling at a 45 to 5% basis. But money had to be raised, and the attempt was made to borrow it direct from the lenders instead of from the banker middleman. Among the cities which raised money in this way were Philadelphia, Baltimore, St. Paul, and Utica, New York. Philadelphia, under Mayor Blankenberg's inspiration, sold nearly $4,170,000 in about two days on a 4% basis, and another over-the-counter sale has been made since. In Baltimore, with the assistance of the Sun, $4,766,000 were sold over-the-counter on a 4% basis. Utica's Two popular sales of 4.5% bonds were largely oversubscribed, and since then, other cities, large and small, have had their over-the-counter bond sales. The experience of Utica, as stated by its controller, Fred G. Roycewig, must prove of general interest. In June of the present year, <clears throat> I advertised for sale two issues, one of $100,000 and the other of $19,000, bearing interest at 4.5%. The latter issue was purchased at par by a local bidder. Of the former, we purchased $10,000 for our sinking funds. That left $90,000 unsold, for which there were no bidders, which was the first time that I had been unable to sell our bonds. About this time, the popular sales of Baltimore and Philadelphia attracted my attention. The laws in effect in those cities did not restrict the officials, as does our law, and I could not copy their methods. I realized that there was plenty of money in this immediate vicinity if I could devise a plan conforming with our laws under which I could make the sale attractive to small investors. It would undoubtedly prove successful. Successful. I had found in previous efforts to interest people of small means that they did not understand the meaning of premium and would rather not buy than bid above par. They also objected to making a deposit with their bids. In arranging for the popular sales, I announced in the papers that, while I must award to the highest bidder, it was my opinion that a par bid would be the highest bid. I also announced that we would issue bonds in denominations as low as $100, and that we would not require a deposit except where the bid was $5,000 or over. Then I succeeded in getting the local papers to print editorials and local notices upon the subject of municipal bonds, with particular reference to those of Utica and the forthcoming sale. 
all the prospective purchaser had to do was to fill in the amount desired sign his name seal the bid and await the day for the award i did not have many bidders for very small amounts there was only one for one hundred dollars at the first sale and one for one hundred dollars at the second sale and not more than ten who wanted less than five hundred dollars most of the bidders were looking for from one thousand to five thousand dollars but nearly all were people of comparatively small means and with some the investment represented all their savings in awarding the bonds i gave preference to residents of utica and i had no difficulty in apportioning the various maturities in a satisfactory way i believe that there are a large number of persons in every city who would buy their own bonds if the way were made easier by law syracuse and the neighboring village of ilion both of which had been unable to sell in the usual way came to me for a program of procedure and both have since had successful sales along similar lines we have been able to by this means to keep the interest rate on our bonds at four and a half percent while cities which have followed the old plan of relying upon bond houses have had to increase the rate to five per cent i am in favor of amending the law in such a manner that the common council approved by the board of estimate and apportionment may fix the prices at which bonds shall be sold instead of calling for competitive bids then place the bonds on sale at the controller's office to anyone who will pay the price the prices upon each issue should be graded according to the different values of different maturities under the present law as we have it conditions are too complicated to make a sale practicable except upon a basis of par bids salesmanship and education such success as has already been attained is largely due to the unpaid educational work of leading progressive newspapers but the educational work to be done must not be confined to teaching the people the buyers of the bonds municipal officials and legislators have quite as much to learn they must first of all study salesmanship selling bonds to the people is a new art still undeveloped the general problems have not yet been worked out and besides these problems common to all states and cities there will be in nearly every community local problems which must be solved and local difficulties which must be overcome the proper solution even of the general problems must take considerable time there will have to be many experiments made and doubtless there will be many failures every great distributor of merchandise knows the obstacles which he had to overcome before success was attained and the large sums that had to be invested in opening and preparing a market individual concerns have spent millions in wise publicity and have ultimately reaped immense profits when the market was won cities must take their lessons from these great distributors cities must be ready to study the problems and to spend prudently for proper publicity work it might in the end prove an economy even to allow on particular issues where necessary a somewhat higher interest rate than bankers would exact if thereby a direct market for bonds could be secured future operations would yield large economies and the obtaining of a direct market for city bonds is growing ever more important because of the huge increase in loans which must attend the constant expansion of municipal functions in eighteen ninety eight the new municipal issues aggregated one hundred and three million eighty four thousand seven hundred and ninety three in nineteen twelve three hundred and eighty million eight hundred and ten thousand two hundred and eighty seven dollars savings banks as customers in new york massachusetts and the other sixteen states where a system of purely mutual savings banks is general it is possible with little organization 
to develop an important market for the direct purchaser of bonds. The bonds issued by Massachusetts cities and towns have averaged recently about $15 million a year, and those of the state about $3 million. The 194 Massachusetts savings banks, with the aggregate assets of $902,105,755.94, held on October 31st, 1912, ninety million five hundred thirty six thousand five hundred eighty one and thirty two cents in bonds and notes of state municipalities of this sum about sixty million dollars are invested in bonds and notes of massachusetts cities and towns and about eight million dollars in state issues the deposits in the savings banks are increasing at the rate of over thirty million dollars a year Massachusetts state and municipal bonds have, within a few years, come to be issued tax-exempt in the hands of the holder, whereas other classes of bonds usually held by savings banks are subject to a tax of one-half of one percent of the market value. Massachusetts savings banks, therefore, will to an increasing extent select Massachusetts municipal issues for high-grade bond investments. Certainly, Massachusetts cities and towns might, with the cooperation of the Commonwealth, easily develop a home market for over-the-counter bond business with the savings banks. And the savings banks of other states offer similar opportunities to their municipalities. Cooperation. Bankers obtained their power through combination. Why should not cities and states by means of cooperation, free themselves from the bankers. For, by cooperation between the cities and the state, the direct marketing of municipal bonds could be greatly facilitated. Massachusetts has 33 cities, each with a population of over 12,000 persons, 71 towns, each with a population of over 5,000, and 250 towns, each with a population of less than 5,000. 308 of these municipalities now have funded indebtedness outstanding. The aggregate net indebtedness is about $180 million. Every year, about $15 million of bonds and notes are issued from the Massachusetts cities and towns for the purpose of meeting new requirements and refunding old indebtedness. If these municipalities would cooperate in marketing securities, the market for the bonds of each municipality would be widened, and there would exist also a common market for Massachusetts municipal securities, which would be usually well supplied, would receive proper publicity, and would attract investors. Successful merchandising obviously involves carrying an adequate, well-assorted stock. If every city acts alone in endeavoring to market its bonds direct, the city's bond-selling activity will necessarily be sporadic. Its ability to supply the investor will be limited by its own necessities for money. The market will also be limited to the bonds of the particular municipality. But if a state and its cities should cooperate, there could be developed a continuous and broad market for the sales of bonds over the counter. The joint selling agency of over 300 municipalities, as in Massachusetts, would naturally have a constant supply of assorted bonds and notes which could be had in as small amounts as the investor might want to buy them. It would be a simple matter to establish such a joint selling agency by which municipalities under proper regulation of and aid from the state would cooperate. And cooperation among the cities and with the state might serve in another important aspect. These 354 Massachusetts municipalities carry in the aggregate large bank balances. Sometimes the balance carried by a city represents unexpended revenues, sometimes unexpended proceeds of loans. On these balances, they usually receive from the banks 2% interest. The balances of municipalities vary like those of other depositors. One having idle funds when another is in need. Why should not all of these cities and towns cooperate, making, say, the state their common banker, and supply each other with funds as farmers and laborers cooperate through credit unions? Then cities would get, instead of 2% on their balances, 
all their money was worth. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts holds now in its sinking and other funds nearly $30 million of Massachusetts municipal securities, constituting nearly three-fourths of all securities held in these funds. Its annual purchases aggregate nearly $4 million. Its purchases direct from cities and towns have already exceeded $1 million this year. It would be but a simple extension of the state's function to cooperate as indicated in a joint municipal bond selling agency and credit union. It would be a distinct advance in the efficiency of state and municipal financing and what is even more important a long step toward the emancipation of the people from banker control. Corporate self-help. Strong corporations with established reputations, locally or nationally, could emancipate themselves from the banker in a similar manner. Public service corporations in some of our leading cities could easily establish over-the-counter home markets for their bonds and would be greatly aided in this by the supervision now being exercised by some state commissions over the issue of securities by such corporations. Such corporations would gain thereby not only in freedom from banker control and exactions, but in the winning of valuable local support. The investor's money would be followed by his sympathy. In things economic as well as in things political, wisdom and safety lie in direct appeals to the people. The Pennsylvania Railroad now relies largely upon its stockholders for new capital. But a corporation with its long continued success and reputation for stability should have much wider financial support and should eliminate the banker altogether with the 2,700 stations on its system. The Pennsylvania could, with a slight expense, create nearly as many avenues through which money could be obtainable to meet its growing needs. Banker protectors. It may be urged that reputations often outlive the conditions which justify them, that outlived reputations are pitfalls to the investors, and that the investment banker is needed to guard him from such dangers. True, but when have the big bankers or their satellites protected the people from such pitfalls? Was there ever a more bebankered railroad than the New Haven? Was there ever a more banker-led community of investors than New England? Six years before the fall of that great system, the hidden dangers were pointed out to those banker experts. Proof was furnished of the rotting timbers. The disaster breeding politics were laid bare. The bankers took no action. Repeatedly thereafter, the bankers' attention was called to the steady deterioration of the structure. The New Haven books disclose 11,481 stockholders who are residents of Massachusetts, 5,682 stockholders in Connecticut, 735 in Rhode Island, and 3,510 in New York. Of the New Haven stockholders, 10,474 were women. Of the New Haven stockholders, 10,222 were of such modest means that their holdings were from one to ten shares only. The investors were sorely in need of protection. The city directories disclose 146 banking houses in Boston, 26 in Providence, 33 in New Haven and Hartford, and 357 in New York City. But who connected with those New England and New York banking houses during the long years which preceded the recent investigation of the Interstate Commerce Commission raised either voice or pen in protest against the continuous mismanagement of that great trust property or warned the public of the impending disaster. Some of the bankers sold their own stock holdings. Some bankers whispered to a few favored customers advice to dispose of New Haven stock but not one banker joined those who sought to open the eyes of New England to the impending disaster and to avert it by timely measures. New England's leading bank
banking houses were ready to cooperate with the New Haven management in taking generous commissions for marketing the endless supply of new securities, and they did nothing to protect the investors. Were these bankers blind, or were they afraid to oppose the will of J.P. Morgan and Company? Perhaps it is the banker who, most of all, needs the new freedom. End of chapter 6, recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski, JTK, www.validateyourlife.com. Chapter number seven of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski, John K. Thomas. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandis. Chapter seven. Big Men and Little Business. J.P. Morgan and Co. declare in a letter to the Pujo Committee, that practically all the railroad and industrial development of this country has taken place initially through the medium of the great banking houses. That statement is entirely unfounded, in fact. On the contrary, nearly every such contribution to our comfort and prosperity was initiated without their aid. The great banking houses came into relation with these enterprises either after successes had been attained or upon reorganization after the possibility of success had been demonstrated. But the funds of the hardy pioneers who had risked their all were exhausted. This is true of our early railroads, of our early street railways, and of the automobile, of the telegraph and the wireless, of gas and oil, of harvesting machinery, and of our steel industry, of textile, paper, and shoe industries, and of nearly every other important branch of manufacture. The initiation of each of these enterprises may properly be categorized as great transactions, and the men who contributed the financial aid and business management necessary for their introduction are entitled to share equally with inventors in our gratitude for what has been accomplished. But the instances are extremely rare where the original financing of such enterprises was undertaken by investment bankers, great or small. It was usually done by some common businessman accustomed to taking risks or by some well-to-do friend of the inventor or pioneer who was influenced largely by considerations other than money-getting here and there you will find that banker aid was given, but usually, in those cases, it was a small local banking concern, not a great banking house, which helped to initiate the undertaking. Railroads. We have come to associate the great bankers with railroads, but their part was not conspicuous in the early history of the eastern railroads, and in the Middle West the experience was, to some extent, similar. The Boston and Maine Railroad owns and leases 2,215 miles of the line, but it is a composite of about 166 separate railroad companies. The New Haven Railroad owns and leases 1,996 miles of the line, but it is a composite of 112 separate railroad companies. The necessary capital to build these little roads was gathered together partly through state, county, or municipal aid, partly from businessmen or landholders who sought to advance their special interests, partly from inventors, and partly from well-to-do, public-spirited men who wished to promote the welfare of their particular communities. About seventy-five years after the first of these railroads was built, J.P. Morgan & Co. became fiscal agent for all of them by creating the new Haven, Boston, and Maine monopoly. Steamships The history of our steamships lines is similar. In 1807, Robert Fulton, with the financial aid of Robert R. Livingston, a judge and statesman, not a banker, demonstrated with the Claremont that it was practicable to propel boats by stream. 
In 1833, the three Cunard brothers of Halifax and 232 other persons, stockholders of the Quebec and Halifax Steam Navigation Company, joined in supplying about $80,000 to build the Royal William, the first steamer to cross the Atlantic. In 1902, many years after individual enterprises had developed practically all the great ocean lines, J.P. Morgan & Co. floated the International Mercantile Marine with its $52,744,000 of four and a half bonds, now selling at 60, and a hundred million dollars of stock, preferred and common, on which no dividend has ever been paid. It was just 62 years after the first regular line of trans atlantic steamers the cunard was founded that mr morgan organized the shipping trust telegraph the story of the telegraph is similar the money for developing morse's invention was supplied by his partner and co-worker alfred vale the initial line from washington to baltimore was built with an appropriation of thirty thousand made by congress in 1843 66 years later j p morgan and co became bankers for the western union to financing its purchase by the american telephone and telegraph company harvesting machinery next to railroads and steamships harvesting machinery has probably been the most potent factor in the development of america and most important of the harvesting machines was Cyrus H. McCormick's reaper. That made it possible to increase the grain harvest twenty or thirty-fold. No investment banker had any part in introducing this great businessman's invention. McCormick was, without means, but William Butler Ogden, a railroad builder, ex-mayor and leading citizen of Chicago, supplied $25,000 with which the first factory was built there in 1847. Forty-five years later, J.P. Morgan & Co. performed the service of combining the five great harvester companies and receiving a commission of $3 million. The concerns then consolidated as the International Harvester Company, with a capital stock of $120 million, had, despite their huge assets and earning power, been previously capitalized in the aggregate at only ten million five hundred thousand dollars strong evidence that in all the preceding years no investment banker had financed them indeed mccormick was as able in business as in mechanical invention two years after ogden paid him twenty five thousand dollars for a half interest in the business mccormick bought it back for fifty thousand dollars and thereafter until his death in 1884, no one but members of the McCormick family had any interest in the business. The Banker Era It may be urged that railroads and steamships, the telegraph and harvesting machinery, were introduced before the accumulation of investment capital had developed the investment banker and before America's great banking houses had been established, and that, consequently, it would be fair to inquire what services bankers had rendered in connection with later industrial development. The firm of J.P. Morgan & Co. is 55 years old. Kuhn, Loeb & Co., 56 years old. Lee, Higginson & Co., over 50 years. And Kidder, Peabody & Co., 48 years. And yet the investment banker seems to have had almost as little part in initiating the great improvements of the last half century as did bankers in the earlier period. Steel. The modern steel industry of America is 45 years old. The great bankers had no part in initiating it. Andrew Carnegie, then already a man of large means, introduced the Bessemer process in 1868. In the next 30 years, our steel and iron industry increased greatly. By 1898, we had far outstripped all competitors. America's production about equaled the aggregate of England and Germany. 
we had also reduced costs so much that europe talked of the american peril it was 1898 when J.P. Morgan & Co. took their first step in forming the Steel Trust by organizing the Federal Steel Company. Then followed the combination of the two mills into an $80 million corporation, J.P. Morgan & Co., taking for their syndicate services $20 million of common stock. About the same time, the consolidation of the bridge and structural works the tin plate, the sheet steel, the hoop, and other mills followed, and finally, in 1901, the steel trust was formed, with a capitalization of $1,402,000,000. These combinations came 30 years after the steel industry had been initiated. The telephone. The telephone industry is less than 40 years old. It is probably America's greatest contribution to industrial development. The bankers had no part in initiating it. The glory belongs to a simple, enthusiastic, warm-hearted businessman of Haverhill, Massachusetts, who was willing to risk his own money. H. N. Casson tells of this most interestingly in his History of the Telephone. The man who had money and dared to stake it on the future of the telephone was Thomas Sanders, and he did this not mainly for business reasons. Both he and Hubbard were attached to Bell primarily by sentiment, as Bell had removed the blight of dumbness from Sanders' little son and was soon to marry Hubbard's daughter. Also, Sanders had no expectation at first that so much money would be needed. He was not rich. His entire business, which was that of cutting out soles for shoe manufacturers, was not at any time worth more than thirty-five thousand dollars. Yet, from 1874 to 1878, he had advanced nine-tenths of the money that was spent on the telephone. The first five thousand telephones and more were made with his money. And so many long, expensive months dragged by before any relief came to Sanders, that he was compelled, much against his will and his business judgment, to stretch his credit within an inch of the breaking point to help Bell and the telephone. Desperately, he signed note after note until he faced a total of $110,000. If the new scientific toy succeeded, which he often doubted, he would be the richest citizen in Haverville, and if it failed, which he sorely feared, he would be a bankrupt. Sanders and Hubbard were leasing telephones two by two to businessmen who previously had been using the private lines of the Western Union Telegraph Company. This great corporation was, at this time, their natural and inevitable enemy. It had swallowed most of its competitors and was reaching out to monopolize all methods of communication by wire. The rosiest hope that shone in front of Sanders and Hubbard was that the Union, the Western Union, might conclude to buy the Bell patents, just as it had already bought many others. In one moment of discouragement, they had offered the telephone to President Orton of the Western Union for $100,000, and Orton had refused it. What use, he said pleasantly, could this company make of an electrical toy? But besides the operation of its own wires, the Western Union was supplying customers with various kinds of printing telegraphs and dial telegraphs, some of which could transmit 60 words a minute. These accurate instruments, it believed, could never be displaced by such a scientific oddity as the telephone, and it continued to believe this until... One of its subsidiary companies, the Gold and Stock, reported that several of its machines had been superseded by telephones. At once, the Western Union awoke from its indifference. Even this tiny nibbling at its business must be stopped. It took action quickly and organized the American Speaking Telephone Company, and with $300,000 capital, and with three electrical inventors, Edison, Gray, and Dolbeer, on its staff. With all the bulk of its great wealth and prestige, 
it swept down upon bell and his little bodyguard it trampled upon bell's patent with as little concern as an elephant can have when he tramples upon an ant's nest to the complete bewilderment of bell it coolly announced that it had the only original telephone and that it was ready to supply superior telephones with all the latest improvements made by the original inventors dolbeer gray and edison the result was strange and unexpected the bell group instead of being driven from the field were at once lifted to a higher level in the business world and the western union in the endeavor to protect its private lines became involuntarily a bellwether to lead capitalists in the direction of the telephone even then when financial aid came to the bell enterprise it was from capitalists not from bankers and among these capitalists was william h forbes son of the builder of the burlington who became the first president of the bell telephone company that was in eighteen seventy eight more than twenty years later after the telephone had spread over the world the great house of morgan came into financial control of the property the american telephone and telegraph company was formed the process of combination became active since january nineteen hundred its stock has increased from twenty five million eight hundred eighty six thousand three hundred to three hundred forty four million six hundred six thousand four hundred in six years nineteen o six to nineteen twelve the morgan associates marketed about three hundred million dollars bonds of that company or its subsidiaries in that period the volume of business done by the telephone companies had of course grown greatly and the plant had to be constantly increased but the proceeds of these huge security issues were used to a large extent in affecting combinations that is in buying out telephone competitors in buying control of the western union telegraph company and in buying up outstanding stock interests in semi-independent bell companies it is these combinations which have led to the investigation of the telephone company by the department of justice and they are in large part responsible for the movement to have the government take over the telephone business electrical machinery the business of manufacturing electrical machinery and apparatus is only a little over thirty years old j p morgan and co became interested early in one branch of it but their dominance of the business today is due not to their initiating it but to their effecting a combination and organizing the general electric company in eighteen ninety two there were then three large electrical companies the thompson houston the edison and the westinghouse besides some small ones the thompson houston of lynn massachusetts was in many respects the leader having been formed to introduce among other things important inventions of professor elihu thompson and professor houston lynn is one of the principal shoe manufacturing centers of america it is within ten miles of state street boston but Thompson's early financial support came not from Boston bankers, but mainly from Lynn businessmen and investors, men active, energetic, and used to taking risks with their own money. Prominent among them was Charles A. Coffin, a shoe manufacturer who became connected with the Thompson Houston Company upon his organization and president of the General Electric, when Mr. Morgan formed that company in 1892 by combining the Thompson Houston and the Edison. To his continued service, supported by other Thompson Houston men in high positions, the great prosperity of the company is, in large part, due the two companies so combined controlled probably one half of all electrical patents then existing in america and certainly more than half of those which had any considerable value 
in eighteen ninety six the general electric pooled its patents with the westinghouse and thus competition was further restricted in nineteen o three the general electric absorbed the stanley electric company its other large competitor and became the largest manufacturer of electric apparatus and machinery in the world in nineteen twelve the resources of the company were a hundred and thirty one million nine hundred forty two thousand one hundred forty four it builds sales to the amount of eighty nine million one hundred eighty two thousand one hundred eighty five it employed directly over sixty thousand persons more than a fourth as many as the steel trust and it is protected against undue competition for one of the morgan partners has been a director since nineteen o nine in the westinghouse the only other large electrical machinery company in america the automobile the automobile industry is about twenty years old it is now america's most prosperous business when henry b joy president of the packard motor car company was asked to what extent the bankers aided in initiating the automobile he replied it is the observable facts of history it is also my experience of thirty years as a businessman banker etc that first the seer conceives an opportunity he has faith in his almost second sight he believes he can do something develop a business construct an industry build a railroad or niagara falls power company and make it pay now the human measure is not the actual physical construction but the make it pay a man raised the money in the late nineties and built a beet sugar factory in michigan wiseacres said it was nonsense he gathered together the money from his friends who would take a chance with him he not only built the sugar factory and there was never any doubt of his ability to do that but he made it pay the next year two more sugar factories were built and were financially successful these were built by private individuals of wealth taking chances in the face of cries of doubting bankers and trust companies once demonstrated that the industry was a sound one financially and then bankers and trust companies would lend the new sugar companies which were speedily organized a large part of the necessary funds to construct and operate the motor car business was the same when a few gentlemen followed me in my vision of the possibilities of the business the banks and older businessmen who in the main were the banks said fools and their money soon be parted etc etc private capital at first establishes an industry backs it through its troubles and if possible wins financial success when banks would not lend a dollar of aid the business once having proved to be practical and financially successful then do the banks lend aid to its needs such also was the experience of the greatest of the many financial successes in the automobile industry the ford motor company how bankers arrest development but great banking houses have not merely failed to initiate industrial development they have definitely arrested development because to them the creation of the trusts is largely due the recital in the memorial address to the president by the investors guild in november nineteen eleven is significant it is a well-known fact that modern trade combinations tend strongly toward constancy of process and products and by their very nature are opposed to new processes and new products originated by independent inventors and hence tend to restrain competition in the development and sale of patents and patent rights and consequently tend to discourage independent inventive thought to the great detriment of the nation and with injustice to inventors whom the constitution especially intended to encourage and protect in their rights and more specific was the testimony of the engineering news 
We are today something like five years behind Germany in iron and steel metallurgy, and such innovations as are being introduced by our iron and steel manufacturers are most of them merely following the lead set by foreigners years ago. We do not believe this is because American engineers are, le are any less ingenious or original than those of Europe, though they may indeed be deficient in training and scientific education compared with those of Germany. We believe the main cause is the wholesale consolidation which has taken place in American industry. A huge organization is too clumsy to take up the development of an original idea. With a market closely controlled and profits certain by following standard methods, those who control our trusts do not want the bother of developing anything new. We instance metallurgy only by way of illustration. There are plenty of other fields of industry where exactly the same condition exists. We are building the same machines and using the same methods as a dozen years ago, and the real advances in the art are being made by European inventors and manufacturers, to which President Wilson's statement may be added. I am not saying that all invention had been stopped by the growth of trusts, but I think it is perfectly clear that invention in many fields has been discouraged, that inventors have been prevented from reaping the full fruits of their ingenuity and industry, and that mankind has been deprived of many comforts and conveniences, as well as the opportunity of buying at lower prices. Do you know, have you had occasion to learn that there is no hospitality for invention nowadays trusts and financial concentration the fact that industrial monopolies arrest development is more serious even than the direct burden imposed through extortionate prices but the most harm bearing instance of the trusts is their promotion of financial concentration industrial trusts feed the money trust Practically every trust created has destroyed the financial independence of some communities and of many properties, for it has centered the financing of a large part of whole lines of business in New York, and this usually with one of a few banking houses. This is well illustrated by the Steel Trust, which is a trust of trusts, that is, the steel trust combines in one huge holding company the trust previously formed in the different branches of the steel business. Thus, the tube trust combines 17 tube mills, located in 16 different cities, scattered over five states, and owned by 13 different companies. The wire trust combined 19 mills, the sheet steel trust 26, the bridge and structural trust 27, and the tin plate trust 36, all scattered similarly over many states. Finally, these and other companies were formed into the United States Steel Corporation, combining 228 companies in all, located in 127 cities and towns scattered over 18 states, before the combinations were effected. Nearly every one of these companies was owned largely by those who managed it, and had been financed to a large extent in the place or in the state in which it was located. When the Steel Trust was formed, all these concerns came under one management. Thereafter, the financing of each of these 228 corporations, and some which were later acquired, had to be done through or with the consent of J.P. Morgan & Co. That was the greatest step in financial concentration ever taken. Stock Exchange Incidents The organization of trusts has served in another way to increase the power of the money trust. Few of the independent concerns out of which the trusts have been formed were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and few of them had financial offices in New York. Promoters of large corporations whose stock is to be held by the public and also investors desire to have their securities listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Under the rules of the exchange, no security can be so listed unless the corporation has a transfer agent and registrar in New York City. Furthermore, banker directorships have contributed largely 
to the establishment of the financial offices of the trusts in new york city that alone would tend to financial concentration but the listing of the stock enhances the power of the money trust in another way an industrial stock once listed frequently becomes the subject of active speculation and speculation feeds the money trust indirectly in many ways it draws the money of the country to new york the new york bankers handle the loans of other people's money on the stock exchange and members of the stock exchange receive large amounts from commissions for instance there are five million eighty four thousand nine hundred fifty two shares of united states steel common stock outstanding but in the five years ending december thirty first nineteen twelve speculation in that stock was so extensive that there were sold on the exchange an average of twenty nine million three hundred and eighty thousand eight hundred eighty eight shares a year or nearly six times as much as there is steel common in existence except where the transactions are by or for the broker's sales on the exchange involve the payment of twenty five cents in commission for each share of stock sold that is twelve and one half cents by the seller and twelve and one half cents by the buyer thus the commission from the steel common alone afforded a revenue averaging many millions a year the steel preferred stock is also much traded in and there are a hundred and thirty eight other industrials largely trusts listed on the new york stock exchange trust ramifications but the potency of trusts as a factor in financial concentration is manifested in still other ways notably through their ramifying operations this is illustrated forcibly by the general electric company's control of water power companies which has now been disclosed in an able report of the united states bureau of corporations the extent of the general electric influence is not fully revealed by its consolidated balance sheet a very large number of corporations are connected with it through its subsidiaries and through corporations controlled by these subsidiaries or affiliated with them there is a still wider circle of influence due to the fact that officers and directors of the general electric co and its subsidiaries are also officers or directors of many other corporations some of whose securities are owned by the General Electric Company. The General Electric Company holds, in the first place, all the common stock in three security holding companies, the United Electric Securities Company, the Electrical Securities Corporation, and the Electric Bond and Share Company directly. And through these corporations and their officers, the General Electric controls a large part of the water power of the United States. The water power companies in the General Electric Group are found in 18 states. These 18 states have 2,325,757 commercial horsepower developed or under construction. And this total, the General Electric Group includes 939,000 115 HP or 40.4 percent the greatest amount of power controlled by the companies in the General Electric group in any state is found in Washington this is followed by New York Pennsylvania California Montana Iowa Oregon and Colorado in five of the states shown in the table the water power companies included in the General Electric group control more than 50 percent of the commercial power developed and under construction the percentage of power in the states included in the general electric group ranges from a little less than two percent in michigan to nearly eighty percent in pennsylvania in colorado they control seventy two percent in new hampshire sixty one percent in oregon fifty eight percent and in washington fifty five percent Besides the power developed and under construction, water power concerns included in the General Electric Group own in the state shown in the table 
641,600 HP undeveloped. This water power control enables the General Electric Group to control other public service corporations. The water power companies subject to General Electric influence control the street railways in at least 16 cities and towns. The electric light plants in 78 cities and towns, gas plants in 19 cities and towns, and are affiliated with the electric light and gas plants in other towns. Though many of these communities, particularly those served with light only, are small, several of them are the most important in the states where these water power companies operate. The water power companies in the General Electric Group own, control, or are closely affiliated with the street railways in Portland and Salem, Oregon. Spokane, Washington, Great Falls, Montana, St. Louis, Missouri, Winona, Minnesota, Milwaukee, and Racine, Wisconsin, Elmira, New York, Asheville and Raleigh, North Carolina, and other relatively less important towns. The towns in which the lighting plants, electric or gas, are owned or controlled include Portland, Salem, Astoria, and other towns in Oregon, Bellingham, and other towns in Washington, Butte, Great Falls, Bozeman, and other towns in Montana, Leadville and Colorado Springs in Colorado, St. Louis, Missouri, Milwaukee, Racine, and several small towns in Wisconsin, Hudson and Rensselaer, New York, Detroit, Michigan, Asheville and Raleigh, North Carolina, and in fact, one or more towns in practically every community where developed water power is controlled by this group. In addition to the public service corporations thus controlled by the water power companies, subject to general electric influence, there are numerous public service corporations in other municipalities that purchase power from the hydroelectric developments controlled by or affiliated with the General Electric Company. This is true of Denver, Colorado, which has already been discussed. In Baltimore, Maryland, a water power concern in the General Electric Group, namely the Pennsylvania Water and Power Company, sells 20,000 HP to the Consolidated Gas, Electric Light, and Power Company, which controls the entire light and power business of that city. The power to operate all the electric street railway systems of Buffalo, New York, and the General Electric Company, through the financing of public service companies, exercises a like influence in communities where there is no water power. It or its subsidiaries has acquired control of or an interest in the public service corporations of numerous cities where there is no water power connection, and it is affiliated with still others by virtue of common directors. This vast network of relationships between hydroelectric corporations through prominent officers and directors, the largest manufacturer of electrical machinery and supplies in the United States, is highly significant. It is possible that this relationship to such a large number of strong financial concerns through common officers and directors affords the General Electric Company an advantage that may place rivals at a corresponding disadvantage. Whether or not this great financial power has been used to the particular disadvantage of any rival water power concern is not so important as the fact that such power exists and that it might be so used at any time. The Sherman Law The money trust cannot be broken if we allow its power to be constantly augmented. To break the money trust, we must stop that power at its source. The industrial trusts are among its most effective feeders. Those which are illegal should be dissolved. The creation of new ones should be prevented. To this end, the Sherman Law should be supplemented both by providing more efficient judicial machinery and by creating a commission with administrative functions to aid in enforcing the law. When that is done, another step will have been taken toward securing the new freedom. But restrictive legislation alone will not suffice. We should bear in mind the admonition with which 
the commissioner of corporations closes his review of our water power development there is presented such a situation in water powers and other public utilities as might bring about at any time under a single management the control of a majority of the developed water powers in the united states and similar control over the public utilities in a vast number of cities and towns including some of the most important in the country we should conserve all rights which the federal government and the states now have in our natural resources and there should be a complete separation of our industries from railroads and public utilities end of chapter seven recording by john thomas kuz kuzmarski kuz www.validateyourlife.com Chapter 8 of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis. Chapter 8 A Curse of Bigness. Bigness has been an important factor in the rise of the money trust. Big railroad systems, big industrial trusts, big public service companies, and as instruments of these big banks and big trust companies. J.P. Morgan and Company, in their letter of defense to the Peugeot Committee, urged the needs of big business as the justification for financial concentration. They declare that what they euphemistically call cooperation is simply a further result of the necessity for handling great transactions. That the country obviously requires not only the larger individual banks, but demands also that those banks shall cooperate to perform efficiently the country's business. And that a step backward along this line would mean a halt in industrial progress that would affect every wage earner from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The phrase great transactions is used by the bankers apparently as meaning large corporate security issues. Leading bankers have undoubtedly cooperated during the last 15 years in floating some very large security issues, as well as many small ones. But relatively few large issues were made necessary by great improvements undertaken or by industrial development. Improvements and development ordinarily proceed slowly. For them, even where the enterprise involves large expenditures, a series of smaller issues is usually more appropriate than a single large one. This is particularly true in the East, where the building of new railroads has practically ceased. The great security issues in which bankers have cooperated were, with relatively few exceptions, made either for the purpose of effecting combinations or as a consequence of such combinations. Furthermore, the combinations which made necessary these large security issues or underwritings were, in most cases, either contrary to existing statute law or contrary to laws recommended by the Interstate Commerce Commission or contrary to the laws of business efficiency. So both the financial concentration and the combinations which they have served were, in the main, against the public interest. Size, we are told, is not a crime. But size may, at least, become noxious by reason of the means through which it was attained or the uses to which it is put. And it is size attained by combination instead of natural growth which has contributed so largely to our financial concentration. Let us examine a few cases. The Harriman Pacifics J.P. Morgan and Company, in urging the need of large banks and the cooperation of bankers, said, The Attorney General's recent approval of the Union Pacific Settlement calls for a single commitment on the part of bankers of $126 million. This $126 million commitment was not made to enable the Union Pacific to secure capital. On the contrary, 
it was a guarantee that it would succeed in disposing of its Southern Pacific stock to that amount. And when it had disposed of that stock, it was confronted with a serious problem. What to do with the proceeds? This huge underwriting became necessary solely because the Union Pacific had violated the Sherman Law. It had acquired that amount of Southern Pacific stock illegally, and the Supreme Court of the United States finally decreed that the illegality cease. This same illegal purchase had been the occasion, twelve years earlier, of another great transaction, the issue of a $100 million of Union Pacific bonds, which were sold to provide funds for acquiring the Southern Pacific and other stocks in violation of law. Bankers cooperated also to accomplish that. Union Pacific Improvements The Union Pacific and its auxiliary lines, the Oregon Short Line, the Oregon Railway and Navigation, and the Oregon-Washington Railroad, made in the 14 years ending June 30, 1912, issues of securities aggregating 375 million one hundred fifty eight thousand one hundred eighty three dollars of which forty six million five hundred thousand dollars were refunded or redeemed but the large security issues served mainly to supply funds for engaging in illegal combinations or stock speculation the extraordinary improvements and additions that raised the Union Pacific Railroad to a high state of efficiency were provided mainly by the net earnings from the operation of its railroads. And note how great the improvements and additions were. Tracks were straightened, grades were lowered, bridges were rebuilt, heavy rails were laid, old equipment was replaced by new, and the cost of these was charged largely as operating expenses. Additional equipment was added, new lines were built or acquired, increasing the system by 3,524 miles of line. And still other improvements and betterments were made and charged to capital account. These expenditures aggregated $191,512,328, but it needed no large security issues to provide the capital thus wisely expended. The net earnings from the operations of these railroads were so large that nearly all these improvements and additions could have been made without issuing on the average more than $100 million a year of additional securities for new money, and the company still could have paid 6% dividends after 1906 when that rate was adopted. For a while, $13,679,452 a year, on the average, was charged to cost of road and equipment. The surplus net earnings and other funds would have yielded, on the average, $12,750,982 a year available for improvements and additions without raising money on new security issues. How the security proceeds were spent. The $375 million securities, except to the extent of about $13 million required for improvements, and the amounts applied for refunding and redemptions, were available to buy stocks and bonds of other companies. And some of the stocks so acquired were sold at large profits, providing further sums to be employed in stock purchases. The $375 million Union Pacific Line security issues, therefore, were not needed to supply funds for Union Pacific improvements, nor did these issues supply funds for the improvement of any of the companies in which the Union Pacific invested, except that certain amounts were advanced later to aid in financing the Southern Pacific. They served substantially no purpose save to transfer the ownership of railroad stocks from one set of persons to another. Here are some of the principal investments. 1. $91,657,500 in acquiring and financing the Southern Pacific. 2. 
$391,401 in acquiring the Northern Pacific stock and stock of the Northern Securities Company. 3. $45,466,960 in acquiring Baltimore and Ohio stock. 4. $37,000,000. $692,256 in acquiring Illinois Central stock. 5. $23,205,679 in acquiring New York Central stock. 6. $10,395,000 in acquiring Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe stock. 7. $8,946,781 in acquiring Chicago and Alton stock. 8. $11,610,187 in acquiring Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul stock. 9. $6,750,423 in acquiring Chicago and Northwestern stock. 10. $6,936,696 in acquiring Railroad Securities Company stock, Illinois Central stock. The immediate effect of these stock acquisitions, as stated by the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1907, was merely this. Mr. Harriman may journey by steamship from New York to New Orleans, thence by rail to San Francisco, across the Pacific Ocean to China, and returning by another route to the United States, may go to Ogden by any one of three rail lines, and thence to Kansas City or Omaha, without leaving the deck or platform of a carrier, which he controls, and without duplicating any part of his journey. He has further what appears to be a dominant control in the Illinois Central Railroad, running directly north from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes, parallel to the Mississippi River, and 2,000 miles west of the Mississippi River, he controls the only line of railroad parallel to the Pacific coast and running from the Colorado River to the Mexican border. The testimony taken at this hearing shows that about 50,000 square miles of territory in the state of Oregon, surrounded by the lines of the Oregon Short Line Railroad Company, the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company, and the Southern Pacific Company, is not developed, while the funds of those companies which could be used for that purpose are being invested in stocks like the New York Central and other lines having only a remote relation to the territory in which the Union Pacific system is located. Mr. Harriman succeeded in becoming director of 27 railroads with 39,000 354 miles of line, and they extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. The Aftermath On September 9, 1909, less than 12 years after Mr. Harriman first became director in the Union Pacific, he died from overwork at the age of 61. But it was not death only that had set a limit to his achievements. The multiplicity of his investments prevented him from performing for his other railroads the great service that had won him a worldwide reputation as manager and rehabilitator of the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific. Within a few months after Mr. Harriman's death, the serious equipment scandal on the Illinois Central became public, culminating in the probable suicide of one of the vice presidents of that company. The Chicago and Alton, in the management of which Mr. Harriman was prominent from 1899 to 1907, as president, chairman of the board, or executive committeeman, has never regained the prosperity it enjoyed before he and his associates acquired control. The Pierre Marquette has passed again into receiver's hands. Long before Mr. Harriman's death, the Union Pacific had disposed of its Northern Pacific stock because the Supreme Court of the United States declared the Northern Securities Company illegal 
and dissolved the Northern Pacific Great Northern merger. Three years after his death, the Supreme Court of the United States ordered the Union Pacific Southern Pacific merger dissolved. By a strange irony, the law has permitted the Union Pacific to reap large profits from its illegal transactions in Northern Pacific and Southern Pacific stocks. But many other stocks held as investments have entailed large losses. Stocks in the Illinois Central and other companies which cost the Union Pacific $129,894,991.72 had on November 15, 1913, a market value of only $87,851,500, showing a shrinkage of $42,043,491.72, and the average income from them, while held, was only about 4.30% on their cost. A Banker's Paradise Kuhn, Loeb & Company were the Union Pacific bankers. It was in pursuance of a promise which Mr. Jacob H. Schliff, the senior partner, had given, pending the reorganization, that Mr. Harriman first became a member of the Executive Committee in 1897. Thereafter, combinations grew and crumbled, and there were vicissitudes in stock speculations. But the investment bankers prospered amazingly, and financial concentration proceeded without abatement. The bankers and their associates received the commissions paid for purchasing the stocks which the Supreme Court holds to have been acquired illegally and have retained them. The bankers received commissions for underwriting the securities issued to raise the money which to buy the stocks which the Supreme Court holds to have been illegally acquired and have retained them. The bankers received commissions paid for floating securities of the controlled companies while they were thus controlled in violation of law, and have, of course, retained them. Finally, when, after years, a decree is entered to end the illegal combination, these same bankers are on hand to perform the services of undertaker, and receive further commissions for their banker aid in enabling the law-breaking corporation to end its wrongdoing and to comply with the decree of the Supreme Court. And yet, Throughout nearly all this long period, both before and after Mr. Harriman's death, two partners in Kuhn, Loeb & Company were directors or members of the Executive Committee of the Union Pacific, and as such must be deemed responsible with the others for the illegal acts. Indeed, these bankers have not only received commissions for the underwritings of transactions accomplished, though illegal, they have received commissions also for merely agreeing to underwrite a great transaction, which the authorities would not permit to be accomplished. The $126 million underwriting, that the single commitment on the part of the bankers to which J.P. Morgan and Company refer as being called for by the Attorney General's approval of the Union Pacific settlement, never became effective, because the Public Service Commission of California refused to approve the terms of the settlement. But the Union Pacific, nevertheless, paid the Kuhn and Loeb Syndicate a large underwriting fee for having been ready and willing to serve, should the opportunity arise. And another underwriting commission was paid when the Southern Pacific stock was finally distributed, with the approval of Attorney General McReynolds, under the court's decree. Thus the illegal purchase of the Southern Pacific stock yielded directly four crops of commissions, two when it was acquired and two when it was disposed of. And during the intervening period, the illegally controlled Southern Pacific yielded many more commissions to the bankers. For the schedules filed with the Peugeot Committee show that Kuhn, Loeb & Company marketed, in addition to the Union Pacific securities above referred to, $334 million of Southern Pacific and Central Pacific securities between 1903 and 1911. The aggregate amount of the commissions paid to these bankers in connection with the Union Pacific-Southern Pacific transaction is not disclosed. 
It must have been very large, for not only were the transactions great, but the commissions were liberal. The Interstate Commerce Commission finds that bankers received about 5% on the purchase price for buying the first 750,000 shares of Southern Pacific stock, and the underwriting commission on the first $100 million of Union Pacific bonds issued to make that and other purchases was $5 million. How large the two underwriting commissions were, which the Union Pacific paid in effecting the severance of this illegal merger, both the company and the bankers have declined to disclose. Furthermore, the Interstate Commerce Commission showed, clearly, while investigating the Union Pacific's purchase of the Chicago and Alton stock, that the bankers' profits were by no means confined to commissions. The Burlington Such railroad combinations produced injury to the public far more serious than the heavy tax of bankers' commissions and profits. For, in nearly every case, the absorption into a great system of a theretofore independent railroad has involved the loss of financial independence to some community, property, or men, who thereby become subjects or satellites of the money trust. The passing of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy in 1901 to the Morgan Associates presents a striking example of this process. After the Union Pacific acquired the Southern Pacific stock in 1901, it sought control also of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, a most prosperous railroad, having then 7,912 miles of line. The Great Northern and Northern Pacific recognized that Union Pacific control of the Burlington would exclude them from much of Illinois, Missouri, Wisconsin, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and South Dakota. The two northern roads, which were already closely allied with each other, and with J.P. Morgan and Company, thereupon purchased for $215,227,000 of their joint 4% bonds, nearly all of the $100,324,000 par value outstanding Burlington stock. A struggle with the Union Pacific ensued, which yielded soon to harmonious cooperation. The Northern Securities Company was formed with $400 million capital, thereby merging the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific, and the Burlington, and joining the Harriman, Kuhn Loeb with the Morgan Hill interests. Obviously, neither the issue of $215 million joint fours nor the issue of the $400 million Northern Securities stock supplied $1 of funds for improvements of or addition to any of the four great railroad systems concerned in these large transactions. The sole effect of issuing $615 million of securities was to transfer stock from one set of persons to another, and the resulting harmonious cooperation was soon interrupted by the government proceedings, which ended with the dissolution of the Northern Securities Company. But the evil done outlived the combination. The Burlington had passed forever from its independent Boston owners to the Morgan allies, who remained in control. The Burlington, one of Boston's finest achievements, was the creation of John M. Forbes. He was a builder, not a combiner or banker, or wizard of finance. He was a simple, hard-working businessman. He had been a merchant in China at a time when China's trade was among America's big business. He had been connected with shipping and with manufacturers. He had the imagination of the great merchant, the patience and perseverance of the great manufacturer, the courage of the seafarer, and the broad view of the statesman. Bold but never reckless, scrupulously careful of other people's money, he was ready, after due weighing of chances, to risk his own in enterprises promising success. He was in the best sense of the term a great adventurer. Thus equipped, Mr. Forbes entered, in 1852, upon those railroad enterprises which later developed into the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. 
largely with his own money and that of friends who confided in him, he built these railroads and carried them through the panic of 57, when the great banking houses of those days lacked courage to assume the burdens of a struggling, ill-constructed line, staggering under financial difficulties. Under his wise management and that of the men whom he trained, the little Burlington became a great system. It was built on honor and managed honorably. It weathered every other great financial crisis as it did that of 1857. It reached maturity without reorganization or the sacrifice of a single stockholder or bondholder. Investment bankers had no place on the Burlington Board of Directors, nor had the banker practice of being on both sides of a bargain. I am unwilling, said Mr. Forbes, early in his career, to run the risk of having the imputation of buying from a company in which I am interested. About twenty years later, he made his greatest fight to rescue the Burlington from the control of certain contractor directors, whom his biographer, Mr. Pearson, describes as persons of integrity who had conceived that in their twofold capacity as contractors and directors they were fully able to deal with themselves justly. Mr. Forbes thought otherwise. The stockholders whom he had aroused sided with him, and he won. Mr. Forbes was the pioneer among Boston railroad builders. His example and his success inspired many others, for Boston was not lacking then in men who were builders, though some lacked his wisdom and some his character. Her enterprise and capital constructed, in large part, the Union Pacific, the Atchison, the Mexican Central, the Wisconsin Central, and twenty-four other railroads in the West and South. One by one, these Western and Southern railroads passed out of Boston control, the greater part of them into the control of the Morgan Allies. Before the Burlington was surrendered, Boston had begun to lose her dominion, even over the railroads of New England. In 1900, the Boston and Albany was leased to the New York Central, a Morgan property, and a few years later another Morgan railroad, the New Haven, acquired control of nearly every other transportation line in New England. Now nothing is left of Boston's railroad dominion in the west and south except the Eastern Kentucky Railroad, a line 36 miles long, and her control of the railroads of Massachusetts is limited to the Grafton Upton with 19 miles of line and the Boston, Revere, Beach, and Lynn, a passenger road 13 miles long. The New Haven Monopoly The rise of the New Haven Monopoly presents another striking example of combination as a developer of financial concentration, and it illustrates also the use to which large security issues are put. In 1892, when Mr. Morgan entered the New Haven Directorate, it was a very prosperous little railroad, with capital liabilities of $25 million, paying 10% dividends, and operating 508 miles of line. By 1899, the capitalization had grown to $80,477,600, but the aggregate mileage had also grown, mainly through merger or lease of other lines, to 2017. Fourteen years later, in 1913, when Mr. Morgan died and Mr. Mellon resigned, the mileage was 1,097, just 20 miles less than in 1899, but the capital liabilities had increased to $425,935,000. Of course, the business of the railroad had grown largely in those 14 years. The roadbed was improved, bridges built, additional tracks added, and much equipment purchased. And for all this, new capital was needed, and additional issues were needed also, because the company paid out in dividends more than it earned. But of the capital increase, over $200 million was expended in the acquisition of stock or other securities of some 120 other railroads, steamships, street, railway, 
electric, light, gas, and water companies. It was these outside properties which made necessary the much-discussed $67 million 6% bond issue, as well as other large and expensive security issues. For in these 14 years, the improvements on the railroad, including new equipment, have cost on the average only $10 million a year. The New Haven Bankers Few, if any, of those 121 companies which the New Haven acquired had, prior to their absorption by it, been financed by J.P. Morgan and Company. The needs of the Boston and Maine and Maine Central, the largest group, had, for generations, been met mainly through their own stockholders or through Boston banking houses. No investment banker had been a member of the board of directors of either of those companies. The New York, Ontario, and Western, the next largest of the acquired railroads, had been financed in New York, but by persons apparently entirely independent of the Morgan allies. The smaller Connecticut railroads, now combined into central New England, had been financed mainly in Connecticut or by independent New York bankers. The financing of the street railway companies had been done largely by individual financiers or by small and independent bankers in the states or cities where the companies operate. Some of the steamship companies had been financed by their owners, some through independent bankers. As a result of the absorption of these 121 companies into the New Haven system, the financing of all of these railroads, steamship companies, street railways, and other corporations were made tributary to J.P. Morgan and Company, and the independent bankers were eliminated or became satellites and this financial concentration was proceeded with, although practically every one of the 121 companies was acquired by the New Haven in violation of either of the state or federal law, or of both. Enforcement of the Sherman Act will doubtless result in dissolving this unwieldy, illegal combination. The Coal Monopoly Proof of the cooperation of the anthracite railroads is furnished by the ubiquitous presence of George F. Baker on the board of directors of the Reading, the Jersey Central, the Lackawanna, the Lehigh, the Erie, and the New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railroads, which together control nearly all the unmined anthracite as well as the actual tonnage. These roads have been an important factor in the development of the Money Trust. They are charged by the Department of Justice with fundamental violations of both the Sherman Law and the Commodity Clause of the Hepburn Act, which prohibits a railroad from carrying in interstate trade any commodity in which it has an interest, direct or indirect. Nearly every large issue of securities made in the last 14 years by any of these railroads, except the Erie, has been in connection with some act of combination the combination of the anthracite railroads to suppress the construction through the Temple Iron Company of a competing coal road has already been declared illegal by the Supreme Court of the United States. And in the bituminous coal field, the Kanawha District, the United States Circuit Court of Appeals, has recently decreed that a similar combination by the Lakeshore, the Chesapeake and Ohio, and the Hocking Valley be dissolved. Other Railroad Combinations The cases of the Union Pacific and of the New Haven are typical, not exceptional. Our railroad history presents numerous instances of large security issues made wholly or mainly to affect combinations. Some of these combinations have been proper as a means of securing natural feeders or extensions of main lines. But far more of them have been dictated by the desire to suppress active or potential competition, or by personal ambition or greed, or by the mistaken belief that efficiency grows with size. Thus the monstrous combination of the Rock Island and the St. Louis and San Francisco, with over 14,000 miles of line, is recognized now to have been obviously inefficient. It was severed voluntarily, but had it not been, 
must have crumbled soon from inherent defects, if not as a result of proceedings under the Sherman Law. Both systems are suffering now from the effects of this unwise combination. The Frisco, itself greatly overcombined, has paid the penalty in receivership. The Rock Island, a name once expressive of railroad efficiency and stability, has, through its excessive recapitalizations and combinations, become a football of speculators and a source of great apprehension to confiding investors. The combination of the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton and the Pierre Marquette led to several receiverships. There are, of course, other combinations which have not been disastrous to the owners of the railroads. But the fact that a railroad combination has not been disastrous does not necessarily justify it. The evil of the concentration of power is obvious, and as combination necessarily involves such concentration of power, the burden of justifying a combination should be placed upon those who seek to effect it. For instance, what public good has been subserved by allowing the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad Company to issue $50 million of securities to acquire control of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, a widely extended self-sufficient system of 5,000 miles, which under the wise management of President Milton H. Smith had prospered continuously for many years before the acquisition, and which has gross earnings nearly twice as large as those of the Atlantic Coast Line. The legality of this combination has been recently challenged by Senator Lee, and an investigation by the Interstate Commerce Commission has been ordered. THE PENNSYLVANIA The reports from the Pennsylvania suggest the inquiry whether even this generally well-managed railroad is not suffering from excessive bigness. After 1898, it, too, bought in large amounts stock in other railroads, including the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Baltimore and Ohio, and the Norfolk and Western. In 1906, it sold all its Chesapeake and Ohio stock and a majority of its Baltimore and Ohio and Norfolk and Western holdings. Later, it reversed its policy and resumed stock purchases, acquiring, among others, more Norfolk and Western and New York, New Haven, and Hartford, and on December 31, 1912, held securities valued at three hundred thirty one million nine hundred nine thousand one hundred fifty four dollars and thirty two cents of which however a large part represents pennsylvania system securities these securities mostly stocks constitute about one-third of the total assets of the pennsylvania railroad the income on these securities in nineteen twelve averaged only four point three zero per cent on their valuation while the Pennsylvania paid 6% on its stock. But the cost of carrying these foreign stocks is not limited to the difference between this income and outgo. To raise money on these stocks, the Pennsylvania had to issue its own securities, and there is such a thing as an oversupply even of Pennsylvania securities. Oversupply of any stock depresses market values and increases the cost to Pennsylvania of raising new money. Recently came the welcome announcement of the management that it will dispose of its stocks in the anthracite coal mines, and it is intimated that it will divest itself also of other holdings and companies, like the Cambria Steel Company, extraneous to the business of railroading. This policy should be extended to include the disposition also of all stocks in other railroads, like the Norfolk and Western, the Southern Pacific, and the New Haven, which are not part of the Pennsylvania system. Recommendations Six years ago, the Interstate Commerce Commission, after investigating the Union Pacific transaction above referred to, recommended legislation to remedy the evils there disclosed. Upon concluding recently its investigation of the New Haven, the Commission repeated and amplified those recommendations, saying, No student of the railroad problem can doubt that a most prolific source of financial disaster and complication to railroads in the past has been the desire and ability 
of railroad managers to engage in enterprises outside the legitimate operations of their railroads, especially by the acquisition of other railroads and their securities. The evil which results first to the investing public and finally to the general public cannot be corrected after the transaction has taken place. It can be easily and effectively prohibited. In our opinion, the following propositions lie at the foundation of all adequate regulation of interstate railroads. 1. Every interstate railroad should be prohibited from spending money or incurring liability or acquiring property not in the operation of its railroad or in the legitimate improvement, extension, or development of that railroad. 2. No interstate railroad should be permitted to lease or purchase any other railroad, nor to acquire the stocks or securities of any other railroad, nor to guarantee the same, directly or indirectly, without the approval of the federal government. 3. No stocks or bonds should be issued by an interstate railroad except for the purpose sanctioned in the two preceding paragraphs, and none should be issued without the approval of the federal government. It may be unwise to attempt to specify the price at which and the manner in which railroad stocks and securities shall be disposed of, but it is easy and safe to define the purpose for which they may be issued, and to confine the expenditure of the money realized to that purpose. These recommendations are in substantial accord with those adopted by the National Association of Railway Commissioners. They should be enacted into law, and they should be supplemented by amendments of the Commodity Clause of the Hepburn Act, so that 1. Railroads will be effectively prohibited from owning stock in corporations whose products they transport. 2. Such corporations will be prohibited from owning important stock holdings in railroads, and 3. Holding companies will be prohibited from controlling, as does the reading, both a railroad and corporations whose commodities it transports. If laws such as these are enacted and duly enforced, we shall be protected from a reoccurrence of tragedies like the New Haven, of domestic scandals like the Chicago and Alton, and of international ones like the Frisco. We shall also escape from that inefficiency which is attended upon excessive size. But what is far more important, we shall, by legislation, remove a potent factor in financial concentration. Decentralization will begin. The liberated smaller units will find no difficulty in financing their needs without bowing the knee to money lords. And a long step will have been taken toward attainment of the new freedom. End of chapter 8 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 9 of Other People's Money This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Other People's Money by Louise D. Brandes. Chapter 9. The Failure of Banker Management. There is not one moral, but many, to be drawn from the decline of the New Haven and the fall of Mellon. That history offers texts for many sermons. It illustrates the evils of monopoly, the curse of bigness, the futility of lying, and the pitfalls of law-breaking. But perhaps the most impressive lesson that it should teach to investors is the failure of banker management. Banker Control For years, J.P. Morgan and Company were the fiscal agents of the New Haven. For years, Mr. Morgan was the director of the company. He gave to that property probably closer personal attention than to any other of his many interests. Stockholders' meetings are rarely interesting or important, and few indeed must have been the occasions when Mr. Morgan attended any stockholders' meeting of other companies in which he was a director. But it was his habit, when in America, to be present at meetings of the New Haven. In 1907, 
when the policy of monopolistic expansion was first challenged, and again in the meeting of 1909, after Massachusetts had unwisely accorded its sanction to the Boston and Maine merger, Mr. Morgan himself moved the large increases of stock, which were unanimously voted. Of course he attended the important directors' meeting. His will was law. President Mellon indicated this in his statement before Interstate Commerce Commissioner Prudy, while discussing the New York, Westchester, and Boston. The railroad without a terminal in New York, which cost the New Haven $1,500,000 a mile to acquire, and was then costing it, in operating deficits and interest charges, $100,000 a month to run. Quote, I am in a very embarrassing position, Mr. Commissioner, regarding the New York, Westchester, and Boston. I have never been enthusiastic or at all optimistic of its being a good investment for our company in the present or in the immediate future. But people in whom I had greater confidence than I have in myself thought it was wise and desirable. I yielded my judgment. Indeed, I don't know that it would have made much difference whether I yielded or not. End quote. The Banker's Responsibility Bankers are credited with being a conservative force in the community. The tradition lingers that they are preeminently safe and sane. And yet the most grievous fault of this banker-managed railroad has been its financial recklessness, a fault that has already brought heavy losses to many thousands of small investors throughout New England, for whom bankers are supposed to be natural guardians. In a community where its railroad stocks have for generations been deemed absolutely safe investments, the passing of the New Haven and of the Boston and Maine dividends after an unbroken dividend record of generations comes as a disaster. This disaster is due mainly to enterprises outside the legitimate operations of these railroads, for no railroad company has equaled the New Haven in the quantity and extravagance of its outside enterprises. But it must be remembered that neither the president of the New Haven nor any other railroad manager could engage in such transactions without the sanction of the board of directors. It is the directors, not Mr. Mellon, who should bear the responsibility. Close scrutiny of the transactions discloses no justification. On the contrary, scrutiny serves only to make more clear the gravity of the errors committed. Not merely were recklessly extravagant acquisitions made in mad pursuit of monopoly, but the financial judgment, the financiering itself, was conspicuously bad. To pay for property several times what it is worth, to engage in grossly unwise enterprises, are errors of which no conservative directors should be found guilty. For perhaps the most important function of directors is to test the conclusions and curb by calm counsel the excessive zeal of two ambitious managers. But while we have no right to expect from bankers exceptionally good judgment in ordinary business matters, we do have a right to expect from them prudence, reasonably good financiering, and insistence upon straightforward accounting. And it is just the lack of these qualities in the New Haven management to which the severe criticism of the Interstate Commerce Commission is particularly directed. Commissioner Prudy calls attention to the vast increase of capitalization. During the nine years beginning July 1, 1903, the capital of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad Company itself increased from $93 million to about $417 million, excluding premiums. That fact alone would not convict the management of reckless financiering but the fact that so little of the new capital was represented by stock might well raise a question as to its conservativeness. For the indebtedness, including guarantees, was increased over 20 times, from about $14 million to $300 million, while the stock outstanding in the hands of the public was not doubled, $80 million to $158 million. Still, in these days of large things, even such growth of corporate liabilities might be consistent with safe and sane management. But what can be said in defense of the financial judgment of the banker management under which these two railroads find themselves confronted in the fateful year 1913 
with a most disquieting floating indebtedness. On March 31, the New Haven had outstanding $43 million in short-time notes. The Boston and Maine had then outstanding $24,500,000, which have been increased since to $27 million, and additional notes have been issued by several of its subsidiary lines. Mainly to meet its share of these loans, the New Haven, which before its great expansion could sell at par 3.5% bonds convertible into stock at $150 a share, was so eager to issue at par $67,500,000 of its 6% 20-year bonds convertible into stock as to agree to pay J.P. Morgan and Company a 2.5% underwriting commission. True, money was tight then. But is it not very bad financiering to be so unprepared for the tight money market which had long been expected? Indeed, the New Haven's management particularly ought to have avoided such an error, for it committed a similar one in the tight money market of 1907 to 1908, when it had to sell at par $39 million of its 6% 40-year bonds. These huge short-time borrowings of the system were not due to unexpected emergencies or to their monetary conditions. They were of gradual growth. On June 30, 1910, the two companies owed in short-term notes only $10,180,364. On By June 30, 1911, the amount had grown to $30,759,959. By June 30, 1912, to $45,395,000, and in 1913 to over $70 million. Of course, the rate of interest on the loans increased also very largely, and these loans were incurred unnecessarily. They represent, in the main, not improvements on the New Haven or on the Boston and Maine railroads, but money borrowed either to pay for stocks in other companies, which these companies could not afford to buy, or to pay dividends which had not been earned. In five years out of the last six, the New Haven Railroad has, on its own showing, paid dividends in excess of the year's earnings, and the annual deficits disclosed would have been much larger if proper charges for depreciation of equipment and of steamships had been made. In each of the last three years, during which the New Haven had absolute control of the Boston and Maine, the latter paid out in dividends so much in excess of earnings that before April 1913 the surplus accumulated in earlier years had been converted into a deficit. Surely these facts show, at least, an extraordinary lack of financial prudence. Why Banker Management Failed Now, how can the failure of the banker management of the New Haven be explained? A few have questioned the ability, a few the integrity of the bankers. Commissioner Prudy attributed the mistakes made to the company's pursuit of a transportation monopoly. The reason, says he, quote, is as apparent as the fact itself. The present management of that company started out with the purpose of controlling the transportation facilities of New England. In the accomplishment of that purpose, it bought what must be had and paid what must be paid. To this purpose and its attempted execution can be traced every one of these financial misfortunes and derelictions. End quote. But it still remains to find the cause of the bad judgment exercised by the eminent banker management in entering upon and in carrying out the policy of monopoly. For there were as grave errors in the execution of the policy of monopoly as in its adoption. Indeed, it was the aggregation of important errors of detail which compelled first the reduction, then the passing of dividends, and which ultimately impaired the company's credit. The failure of the banker management of the New Haven cannot be explained as the shortcomings of individuals. The failure was not accidental. It was not exceptional. It was the natural result of confusing the functions of banker and businessman. Undivided Loyalty The banker should be detached from the business for which he performs the banking service. This detachment is desirable, in the first place, 
in order to avoid conflict of interest. The relation of banker directors to corporations which they finance has been a subject of just criticism. Their conflicting interests necessarily prevent single-minded devotion to the corporation. When a banker director of a railroad decides as railroad man that it shall issue securities, and then sells them to himself as banker, fixing the price at which they are to be taken, there is necessarily grave danger that the interests of the railroad may suffer, suffer both through issuing of securities which ought not to be issued, and from selling them at a price less favorable to the company than should have been obtained. For it is ordinarily impossible for a banker director to judge impartially between the corporation and himself. Even if he succeeded in being impartial, the relation would not conduce to the best interests of the company. The best bargains are made when buyer and seller are represented by different persons. Detachment and Essential But the objection to banker management does not rest wholly, or perhaps mainly, upon the importance of avoiding divided loyalty. A complete detachment of the banker from the corporation is necessary in order to secure for the railroad the benefit of the clearest financial judgment. For the banker's judgment will be necessarily clouded by participation in the management or by ultimate responsibility for the policy actually pursued. It is outside financial advice which the railroad needs. Long ago it was recognized that, quote, a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client, end quote. The essential reason for this is that soundness of judgment is easily obscured by self-interest. Similarly, it is not the proper function of the banker to construct, purchase, or operate railroads, or to engage in industrial enterprises. The proper function of the banker is to give to or withhold credit from other concerns, to purchase or to refuse to purchase securities from other concerns, and to sell securities to other customers. The proper exercise of this function demands that the banker should be wholly detached from the concern whose credit or securities are under consideration. His decision to grant or to withhold credit, to purchase or not to purchase securities, involves passing judgment on the efficiency of the management or the soundness of the enterprise, and he ought not to occupy a position where in so doing he is passing judgment on himself. Of course detachment does not imply a lack of knowledge. The banker should act only with full knowledge, just as a lawyer should act only with full knowledge. The banker who undertakes to make loans to or purchase securities from a railroad for sale to his other customers ought to have as full knowledge of its affairs as does its legal adviser. But the banker should not be, in any sense, his own client. He should not, in the capacity of banker, pass judgment upon the wisdom of his own plans or acts as railroad man. Such a detached attitude on the part of the banker is demanded also in the interest of his other customers, the purchasers of corporate securities. The investment banker stands toward a large part of his customers in a position of trust, which should be fully recognized. The small investors, particularly the women, who are holding an ever-increasing proportion of our corporate securities, commonly buy on the recommendation of their bankers. The small investors do not, and in most cases cannot, ascertain for themselves the facts on which to base a proper judgment as to the soundness of securities offered. And even if these investors were furnished with the facts, they lack the business experience essential to forming a proper judgment. Such investors need, and are entitled, to have the banker's advice, and obviously their unbiased advice and the advice cannot be unbiased where the banker, as part of the corporation's management, has participated in the creation of the securities which are the subject of sale to the investor. Is it conceivable that the great house of Morgan would have aided in providing the New Haven with the hundreds of millions so unwisely expended, if its judgment had not been clouded by participation in the New Haven's management? End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis. Chapter Ten: The Inefficiency of the Oligarchs. We must break the money trust, or the money trust will break us. The Interstate Commerce Commission said in its report on the most disastrous of the recent wrecks on the New Haven Railroad, On this directorate were and are men whom the confiding public recognize as magicians in the art of finance, and wizards in the construction, operation, and consolidation of great systems of railroads. The public therefore rested secure that with the knowledge of the railroad art possessed by such men, investments in travel should both be safe. Experience has shown that this reliance of the public was not justified as to either finance or safety. This failure of banker management is not surprising. The surprise is that men should have supposed it would succeed, for banker management contravenes the fundamental laws of human limitations first that no man can serve two masters second that a man cannot at the same time do many things well seeming successes there are numerous seeming exceptions to these rules and a relatively few real ones of course many banker managed properties have been prosperous some for a long time at the expense of the public some for a shorter time because of the impetus attained before they were banker managed it is not difficult to have a large net income where one has the field to oneself has all the advantage privilege can give and may charge all the traffic will bear and even in competitive business the success of a long established well organized business with a widely extended good will must continue for a considerable time especially if buttressed by intertwined relations constantly giving it the preference over competitors the real test of efficiency comes when success has to be struggled for when natural or legal conditions limit the charges which may be made for the goods sold or service rendered our banker managed railroads have recently been subjected to such a test and they have failed to pass it it is only says Goethe when working within limitations that the master is disclosed why oligarchy fails banker management fails partly because the private interest destroys soundness of judgment and undermines loyalty it fails partly also because banker directors are led by their occupation and often even by the mere fact of their location remote from the operated properties to apply a false test in making their decisions prominent in the banker director mind is always this thought what will be the probable effect of our action upon the market value of the company's stock and bonds or indeed generally upon the stock exchange values the stock market is so much a part of the investment banker's life that he cannot help being affected by this consideration however disinterested he may be the stock market is sensitive facts are often misinterpreted by the street or by investors and with the best of intentions directors susceptible to such influences are led to unwise decisions in the effort to prevent misinterpretations thus expenditures necessary for maintenance or for the ultimate good of a property are often deferred by banker directors because of the belief that the making of them now would by showing smaller net earnings create a bad and even false impression on the market dividends are paid which should not be because of the effect which it is believed reduction or suspension would have upon the market value of the company's securities to exercise a sound judgment in the difficult affairs of business is at best a delicate operation and no man can successfully perform that function whose mind is diverted however innocently from the study of what is best in the long run for the company of which i am a director the banker director is peculiarly liable to such distortion of judgment by reason of his occupation and his environment but there is a further reason why ordinarily banker management must fail the element of time 
the banker with his multiplicity of interests cannot ordinarily give the time essential to proper supervision and to acquiring that knowledge of the facts necessary to the exercise of sound judgment the century dictionary tells us that a director is one who directs one who guides superintends governs and manages real efficiency in any business in which conditions are ever changing must ultimately depend in large measure upon the correctness of judgment exercised almost from day to day on the important problems as they arise and how can the leading bankers necessarily engrossed in the problems of their own vast private business get time to know and to correlate the facts concerning so many other complex businesses besides they start usually with ignorance of the particular business which they are supposed to direct when the last paper was signed which created the steel trust one of the lawyers as mr perkins frankly tells us said that signature is the last one necessary to put the steel industry on a large scale into the hands of men who do not know anything about it avocations of the oligarchs the new haven system is not a railroad but an agglomeration of a railroad plus one hundred and twenty one separate corporations control of which was acquired by the new haven after that railroad attained its full growth of about two thousand miles of line in administering the railroad and each of the properties formerly managed through these one hundred and two separate companies there must arise from time to time difficult questions on which the directors should pass judgment the real managing directors of the new haven system during the decade of its decline were j pierpont morgan george f baker and william rockefeller mr morgan was until his death in nineteen thirteen the head of perhaps the largest banking house in the world mr baker was until nineteen o nine president and then chairman of the board of directors of one of america's leading banks the first national of new york and mr rockefeller was until nineteen eleven president of the standard oil company each was well advanced in years yet each of these men besides the duties of his own vast business and important private interests undertook to guide superintend govern and manage not only the new haven but also the following other corporations some of which were similarly complex mr morgan forty-eight corporations including forty railroad corporations with at least one hundred subsidiary companies and sixteen thousand miles of line three banks and trust or insurance companies five industrial and public service companies mr baker forty-eight corporations including fifteen railroad corporations with at least one hundred and fifty-eight subsidiaries and thirty-seven thousand four hundred miles of track eighteen banks and trust or insurance companies fifteen public service corporations and industrial concerns mr rockefeller thirty-seven corporations including twenty-three railroad corporations with at least one hundred and seventeen subsidiary companies and twenty-six thousand four hundred miles of line five banks trust or insurance companies nine public service companies and industrial concerns substitutes it has been urged that in view of the heavy burdens which the leaders of finance assume in directing business america we should be patient of error and refrain from criticism lest the leaders be deterred from continuing to perform this public service a very respectable boston daily said a few days after commissioner mccord's report on the north haven wreck it is believed that the new haven pillory repeated with some frequency will make the part of railroad director quite undesirable and hard to fill and more and more avoided by responsible men indeed it may even become so that men will have to be paid a substantial salary to compensate them in some degree for the risk involved in being on the board of directors but there is no occasion for alarm the american people have as little need of oligarchy in business as in politics 
there are thousands of men in america who could have performed for the new haven stockholders the task of one who guides superintends governs and manages better than did mr morgan mr baker and mr rockefeller for though possessing less native ability even the average businessman would have done better than they because working under proper conditions there is great strength in serving with singleness of purpose one master only there is great strength in having time to give to a business the attention which its difficult problems demand and tens of thousands more americans could be rendered competent to guide our important businesses liberty is the greatest developer herodotus tells us that while the tyrants ruled the athenians were no better fighters than their neighbors but when freed they immediately surpassed all others if industrial democracy true cooperation should be substituted for industrial absolutism there would be no lack of industrial leaders england's big business england too has big business but her big business is the cooperative wholesale society with a wonderful story of fifty years of beneficent growth its annual turnover is now about a hundred and fifty million dollars an amount exceeded by the sales of only a few american industrials an amount larger than the gross receipts of any american railroad except the pennsylvania and the new york central systems its business is very diversified for its purpose is to supply the needs of its members it includes that of wholesale dealer of manufacturer of grower of miner of banker of insurer and of carrier it operates the biggest flour mills and the biggest shoe factory in all great britain it manufactures woolen cloths all kinds of men's women's and children's clothing a dozen kinds of prepared foods and as many household articles it operates creameries it carries on every branch of the printing business it is now buying coal lands it has a bacon factory in denmark and a tallow and oil factory in australia it grows tea in ceylon and through all the purchasing done by the society runs this general principle go direct to the source of production whether at home or abroad so as to save commissions of middlemen and agents accordingly it has buyers and warehouses in the united states canada australia spain denmark and sweden it owns steamers plying between continental and english ports it has an important banking department it insures the property and person of its members every one of these departments is conducted in competition with the most efficient concerns in their respective lines in great britain the cooperative wholesale society makes its purchases and manufactures its products in order to supply the thirteen hundred and ninety nine local distributive cooperative societies scattered over all england but each local society is at liberty to buy from the wholesale society or not as it chooses and they buy only if the cooperative wholesale sells at market prices this the cooperative actually does and it is able besides to return to the local a fair dividend on its purchases industrial democracy now how are the directors of this great business chosen not by england's leading bankers or other notabilities supposed to possess unusual wisdom but democratically by all of the people interested in the operations of the society and the number of such persons who have directly or indirectly a voice in the selection of the directors of the english cooperative wholesale society is two million seven hundred and fifty thousand for the directors of the wholesale society are elected by vote of the delegates of the one thousand three hundred and ninety nine retail societies and the delegates of the retail societies are in turn selected by the members of the local societies that is by the consumers on the principle of one man one vote regardless of the amount of capital contributed note what kind of men these industrial democrats select to exercise executive control of their vast organization not all wise bankers or their dummies but men who have risen from the ranks of cooperation 
men who by conspicuous service in the local societies have won the respect and confidence of their fellows the directors are elected for one year only but a director is rarely unseated j t w mitchell was president of the society continuously for twenty-one years thirty-two directors are selected in this manner each gives to the business of the society his whole time and attention and the aggregate salaries of the thirty-two is less than that of many a single executive in american corporations for these directors of england's big business serve each for a salary of about fifteen hundred dollars a year the cooperative wholesale society of england is the oldest and largest of these institutions but similar wholesale societies exist in fifteen other countries the scotch society which william maxwell has served most efficiently as president for thirty years at a salary never exceeding thirty eight dollars a week has a turnover of more than fifty million dollars a year a remedy for trusts albert sonicson general secretary of the cooperative league tells in the american review of reviews for april nineteen thirteen how the swedish wholesale society curbed the sugar trust how it crushed the margarine combine compelling it to dissolve after having lost two million three hundred thousand crowns in the struggle and how in switzerland the wholesale society forced the dissolution of the shoe manufacturers association he tells also this memorable incident six years ago at an international congress in cremona dr hans muller a swiss delegate presented a resolution by which an international wholesale society should be created luigi luzzati italian minister of state and an ardent member of the movement was in the chair those who were present say luzzati paused his eyes lighted up and then dramatically raising his hand he said dr muller proposes to the assembly a great idea that of opposing to the great trusts the rockefellers of the world a world-wide cooperative alliance which shall become so powerful as to crush the trusts cooperation in america america has no wholesale cooperative society able to grapple with the trusts but it has some very strong retail societies like the tamarack of michigan which has distributed in dividends to its members one million one hundred and forty four thousand dollars in twenty-three years the recent high cost of living has greatly stimulated interest in the cooperative movement and john graham books reports that we have already about three hundred and fifty local distributive societies the movement towards federation is progressing there are over one hundred cooperative stores in minnesota wisconsin and other northwestern states many of which were organized by or through the zealous work of mr towsley and his associates of the right relationship league and are in some ways affiliated in new york city eighty-three organizations are affiliated with the cooperative league in new jersey the societies have federated into the american cooperative alliance of northern new jersey in california long the seat of effective cooperative work a central management committee is developing and progressive wisconsin has recently legislated wisely to develop cooperation throughout the state among our farmers the interest in cooperation is especially keen the federal government has just established a separate bureau of the department of agriculture to aid in the study development and introduction of the best methods of cooperation in the working of farms in buying and in distribution and special attention is now being given to farm credits a field of cooperation in which continental europe has achieved complete success and to which david lubin america's delegate to the international institute of agriculture at rome has among others done much to direct our attention people's savings bank the german farmer has achieved democratic banking the thirteen thousand little cooperative credit associations with an average member of about ninety persons are truly banks of the people by the people and for the people first the bank's resources are of the people 
These aggregate about $500 million. Of this amount, $375 million represents the farmer's savings deposits, $50 million the farmer's current deposits, $6 million the farmer's share capital, and $13 million amounts earned and placed in the reserved. Thus, nearly nine-tenths of these large resources belong to the farmers, that is, to the members of the banks. Second, the banks are managed by the people, that is, the members, and membership is easily attained, for the average amount of paid-up share capital was, in 1909, less than $5 per member. Each member has one vote regardless of the number of his shares or the amount of his deposits. These members elect the officers. The committees and trustees, and often even the treasurer, serve without pay, so that the expenses of the banks are, on average, about $150 a year. Third, the banks are for the people. The farmer's money is loaned by the farmer to the farmer at a low rate of interest, usually 4% to 6%, the shareholders receiving on their shares the same rate of interest that the borrowers pay on their loans. Thus, the resources of all farmers are made available to each farmer for productive purposes. This democratic rural banking is not confined to Germany. As Henry W. Wolfe says in his book on cooperative banks, Propagating themselves by their own merits, little people's cooperative banks have overspread Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Switzerland, Belgium. Russia is following up those countries. France is striving strenuously for the possession of cooperative credit. Serbia, Romania, and Bulgaria have made such credit their own. Canada has scored its first success on the road to its acquisition. Cyprus, and even Jamaica, have made their first start. Ireland has substantial first fruits to show of her economic sowings. South Africa is groping its way to the same goal. Egypt has discovered the necessity of cooperative banks, even by the side of Lord Cromer's pet creation, the richly endowed Agricultural Bank. India has made a beginning full of promise. And even in far Japan and in China, People are trying to acclimatize the more perfective organizations of Schultz Dielich and Raffesein. The entire world seems girdled with a ring of cooperative credit. Only the United States and Great Britain still lag lamentably behind. Bankers' Savings Banks The savings banks of America present a striking contrast to these democratic banks. Our savings banks also have performed a great service. They have provided for the people's funds safe depositories with some income return. Thereby, they have encouraged thrift and have created, among other things, reserves for the proverbial rainy day. They have also discouraged old stocking hoarding, which diverts the money of the country from the channels of trade. American savings banks are also, in a sense, banks of the people, for it is the people's money which is administered by them. The four and a half billion dollars deposits in 2,000 American savings banks belong to about 10 million people who have an average deposit of about $450. But our savings banks are not banks by the people, nor in the full sense for the people. First, American savings banks are not managed by the people. The stock savings banks most prevalent in the Middle West and the South are purely commercial enterprises, managed, of course, by the stockholders' representatives. The mutual savings banks, most prevalent in the eastern states, have no stockholders, but the depositors have no voice in the management. The banks are managed by trustees for the people, practically a self-constituted and self-perpetuating body, composed of leading and, to a large extent, public-spirited citizens. Among them, at least in the larger cities, there is apt to be a predominance of investment bankers and bank directors. Thus, the three largest savings banks of Boston, whose aggregate deposits exceed those of the other 18 banks, 
have together 81 trustees. Of these, 52 are investment bankers or directors in other Massachusetts banks or trust companies. Second, the funds of our savings banks, whether stock or purely mutual, are not used mainly for the people. The depositors are allowed interest, usually from 3 to 4 percent. In the mutual savings banks, they receive ultimately all the net earnings. But the money gathered in these reservoirs is not used to aid productively persons of the classes who make the deposits. The depositors are largely wage earners, salaried people, or members of small tradesmen's families. Statically, the money is used for them. Dynamically, it is used for the capitalist. For rare indeed are the instances when savings banks' monies are loaned to advance productively one of the depositor class. Such persons would seldom be able to provide the required security, and it is doubtful whether their small needs would, in any event, receive consideration. In 1912, the largest of Boston's mutual savings banks, the Provident Institution for Savings, which is the pioneer mutual savings bank of America, managed $53 million of people's money. Nearly one half of the resources, $24,262,072, was invested in bonds, state, municipal, railroad, railway, and telephone, and in bank stock or was deposited in national banks or trust companies. Two-fifths of the resources, $20,764,770, were loaned on real estate mortgages, and the average amount of a loan was $52,569. One-seventh of the resources, $7,000,000, was loaned on personal security, and the average of each of these loans was $54,830. Obviously, the small man is not conspicuous among the borrowers, and these large-scale investments do not even serve the individual depositor especially well, for this bank pays its depositors a rate of interest lower than the average. Even our admirable postal savings bank system serves productively mainly the capitalist. These postal savings stations are in fact catch basins merely which collect the people's money for distribution among the national banks. Progress Alphonse Desjardins of Levis, province of Quebec, has demonstrated that cooperative credit associations are applicable also to at least some urban communities. Levis, situated on the St. Lawrence opposite the city of Quebec, is a city of 8,000 inhabitants. Desjardins himself is a man of the people. Many years ago, he became impressed with the fact that the people's savings were not utilized primarily to aid the people productively. There were then located in Levis branches of three ordinary banks of deposit, a mutual savings bank, the postal savings bank, and three incorporated loaners. But the people were not served. After much thinking, he chanced to read of the European rural banks. He proceeded to work out the idea for use in Levis, and in 1900 established there the first credit union. For seven years, he watched carefully the operations of this little bank. The pioneer union had accumulated in that period $80,000 in resources. It had made 2,900 loans to its members aggregating $350,000, the loans averaging $120 in amount, and the interest rate 6.5%. In all this time, the bank had not met with a single loss. Then Desjardins concluded that democratic banking was applicable to Canada, and he proceeded to establish other credit unions. In the last five years, the number of credit unions in the province of Quebec has grown to 121, and 19 have been established in the province of Ontario. Desjardins was not merely the pioneer. All the later credit unions also have been established through his aid, and 24 applications are now in hand requesting like assistance from him. 
Year after year that aid has been given without pay by this public-spirited man of large family and small means who lives as simply as the ordinary mechanic. And it is noteworthy that this rapidly extending system of cooperative credit banks has been established in Canada wholly without government aid, Desjardins having given his services free and his traveling expenses having been paid by those seeking his assistance. In 1909, Massachusetts, under Desjardins' guidance, enacted a law for the incorporation of credit unions. The first union established in Springfield in 1910 was named after Herbert Myrick, a strong advocate of cooperative finance. Since then, 25 other unions have been formed, and the names of the unions and of their officers disclose that 11 are Jewish, eight French Canadian and two Italian, a strong indication that the immigrant is not unprepared for financial democracy. There is reason to believe that these people's banks will spread rapidly in the United States and that they will succeed, for the cooperative building and loan associations, managed by wage earners and salary earners, who join together for systematic saving and ownership of houses, have prospered in many states. In Massachusetts, where they have existed for 35 years, their success has been notable, the number in 1912 being 162 and their aggregate assets nearly $75 million. Thus, farmers, working men, and clerks are learning to use their little capital and their savings to help one another instead of turning over their money to the great bankers for safekeeping and to be themselves exploited. And may we not expect that when the cooperative movement develops in America, merchants and manufacturers will learn from farmers and working men how to help themselves by helping one another, and thus join in attaining the new freedom for all. When merchants and manufacturers learn this lesson, money kings will lose subjects, and swollen fortunes may shrink, but industries will flourish, because the faculties of men will be liberated and developed. President Wilson has said wisely, No country can afford to have its prosperity originated by a small controlling class. The treasury of America does not lie in the brains of the small body of men now in control of the great enterprises. It depends upon the inventions of unknown men, upon the originations of unknown men, upon the ambitions of unknown men. Every country is renewed out of the ranks of the unknown, not out of the ranks of the already famous and powerful in control. End of chapter 10. Recording by Kathleen Nelson, Austin, Texas, May 2010. End of Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis.